Good morning, all, and welcome. My name is Elise Smith, and I am an employment trainer and consultant with Ohio Mental Health and Addiction Services. I am honored to be the first to welcome you to our two-day conference on employing young adult peer providers. Over the next two days, I will be behind the scenes to support you, our facilitators, speakers, and panelists as a producer partner. We ask that should you have any technical issues to please use the chat box, and one of us will help support you. Here is a brief run through of some of the features of the Zoom platform that you should familiarize yourself with for this conference. I will start in the bottom left of your screen with the mute unmute button and the button that will allow you to turn your camera on or off. In order to maintain the highest performance of the platform and the best sound, we ask that you keep yourself muted and if possible, your camera off. If we have feedback at any time, I may come through and manually mute people, but you will have an opportunity to unmute yourself during the question and answer sessions throughout both days. Next, the participants button will display a window to the right of the main screen. Participant view is important for finding the hand raise button, which will be a great help during the question and answer sessions. The chat box is a way to submit a question to hosts or the audience, either privately or publicly, throughout today's and tomorrow's events. As questions arise, please feel free to use the chat field and we will provide them to the presenters at the appropriate time. The invite button will allow you to invite any colleagues that you have to join the conference. Last but not least, towards the top right of your screen, there is a view option, which will toggle your view between speaker view and gallery view. Our team has developed an engaging and fascinating two-day experience for you that will be facilitated by Quanita McRoberts and Laura Payne. And with that, I will hand the mic over to Quanita McRoberts who will navigate you through the rest of day one. Lastly, so you're aware, this event will be recorded and we appreciate your attending. Thank you and enjoy. Good morning, everyone. We are so excited for you to join us. Just a couple of things to let you know the best engagement for participation today. Throughout today's events, there will be opportunities for question and answer sessions for our speakers and panelists tomorrow. Please feel free to type questions into the chat box. And if time allows, we will have an opportunity for participants to unmute and ask questions during the allotted time frames. To maximize your experience, we invite and encourage participants to utilize the speaker view over the next two days. To access this function, please click speaker view in the top right corner. Activating speaker view will switch the larger video window and show you who is speaking with three or more participants in the meeting. Next slide, please. And the question of the hour for CEs, by logging onto the webinar, we will be able to track your attendance and see how long you participated in the training. And if you log out early, this will adjust your certificate and the amount that you participated. And because we are tracking attendance in this fashion, we kindly ask that you adjust your Zoom settings so that you log on with your first and last name. And please know that it is difficult to identify attendees who do not log on with their full names. We will not be able to verify the attendance and for those who have joined. This training, um, we're currently working out the exact number of CEs that it is available for as we have had a difference in scheduling, but we will make sure to have that information to you um, by the end of day two. Um, but it is for the following disciplines, social workers, mental health counselors, prevention professionals, chemical dependency counselors, psychologists, and of course, certified peer supporters can use this towards their certification. At the end of day two training, you will receive an email containing a link to complete an evaluation. If you are requesting CEs, you must include your license number and a certificate will be sent to you within three days of the receipt of the evaluation. 
At the end of day one and day two, we will give you more information about the contact point person who to reach out to. Next slide, please. This is an overlook of our day one agenda. As Elise, our producer noted, we have a robust day planned for you all and we can't really wait to dive into it. So without further ado, next slide. And I will introduce for opening remarks, Lois Hostetler, our Assistant Director of Community Treatment Services for Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Lois, you have the floor for opening remarks. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, I welcome you to the Employing Young Adults as Peer Providers Conference, and thank you for your attendance. We appreciate our keynote speakers, Dr. Jonathan Delman and Dylan St. Germain, for being here virtually and sharing their knowledge about the peer support area of work. Their expertise will guide all of us in our day-to-day -day lives as we learn to be more effective in our work. The department recognizes the value of employing young adult peer providers in Ohio. We know how beneficial to the young people that we serve, especially in working with individuals that are resilient and in recovery. We know your efforts can give them a sense of hope when it seems life is too much to handle alone. Thank you to the systems and providers in attendance for your commitment to learning about how to incorporate young adult peer staff. And a huge thank you to the young adult peers in attendance for your dedication to improving the lives of youth struggling with mental health and or substance use disorders. You always inspire us with your insights and caring attitudes. For all of you in attendance today, never forget that you are making a difference. We look forward to two days of learning valuable information that each person will be able to take back to their community. Enjoy the conference. Thank you, Lois. Now we are going on to the next part of our agenda. And I would like to note, unfortunately, we found out that Dylan will not be able to join us um, due to illness, um, but we have some of his information still being presented through Dr. Delman, um, and Dr. Delman has offered to extend his presentation today. So we are very grateful to still get a great amount of information on this topic. Thank you. So now I will introduce Dr. Delman. He is the technical assistant lead at the Transitions to Adulthood Research and Training Center at the Massachusetts Medical School. Dr. Gelman is a senior associate at the Technical Assistance Collaborative, research professor of psychiatry, and also um, works with lived experience and his own lived experience to the field from and also considered a national expert with vocational supports, recovery-oriented care, measurement of peer support services, community-based participatory mental health action research, and the list goes on. He's also worked with SAMHSA and other agencies on this matter. Without further ado, we introduce Dr. Delman. You have the floor. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, Cornita, this has been a, a long time coming. I remember when I was about to fly out to Ohio back in March, and um, that didn't happen. But I'm so glad that I have the opportunity now to talk to all of you. Um, I'm really excited about the um, challenges and opportunities you're about to take on, and you're doing this with a lot of good thought. So I, I hope to contribute to your um, planning and thinking and ultimately implementation um, if, of introducing young adult peer providers to the um, uh, treatment teams. So just a quick note on language. Um, I, I may have interchangeably used the term peer provider and peer specialist um, or a peer worker. And I think for the time being, those essentially mean the same thing in that um, it refers to someone with a, uh, a mental health condition or substance abuse condition who's working to, with clients 
um, to help them achieve um, recovery. Um, and what makes them different than the rest of staff is that clients know that they are people with lived experience. So to be a peer, somebody, you are known to have lived experience, which is where the peerness comes in, that you as the peer provider and the clients share um, this lived experience. So a quick little bit about me. Um, so I, I'm, uh, I have um, employed uh, young adult peers, peer providers um, in both services and in um, research. So I have 20 years of that experience and um, it's been a, a really great learning experience um trying to think about introducing this new kind of role unique role into mental health services <clears throat> excuse me i think that's always the challenge of any um system or healthcare system is to try to change and trying to change is not easy particularly when you're in part relying on a, a placement of a certain person in the team to impact recovery so we're still learning um but i think we've learned a lot Second, I am a researcher, so I have researched this, um, myself and others have researched the implementation piece to this, and I think we're still working it out. We have some de definitive findings about what works, but we're still trying to get into the details. And um, finally, I, I am currently acting as a vocational specialist in a uh, um, first episode team, working with young adults. With mental health conditions so i'm learning from that and how to support um people i i help get jobs as peer specialists and i work with them as they try to uh, maneuver the clinical world so all of these things have been really um helpful to me and i as i continue to learn okay next slide please so in in the um it's my view that if, if things aren't in writing, they don't exist. So um, as part of my work with the Transitions Research and Training Center at UMass, we put together, myself and Vanessa Klodnik, um, put together a toolkit for effectively employing young adult peer providers. And that covers in pretty good detail, still more to come, what kind of should happen in order to support the peer provider to be successful in the workplace and also to enhance um, quality improvement for the provider. So I will not be going over in tremendous detail any one of these things, but th what I hope to do today is to provide you with a fair enough overview so that you could refer to the um, toolkit and um, get some advice or begin the plan um, your approach to supporting peer specialists in the workplace. Uh, yes, next slide. So this, this project, this toolkit was funded by a, um, a grant from NIDLER, which is the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research um, of the federal government to the UMass Learning and Working um, Center to support the vocational needs of young adults. It was my feeling, it was my feeling, it was my feeling in terms of promoting this project was that young adults with mental health conditions already have a difficult time getting jobs. Um, you know, it, it's, it's no matter what they say about the economy, the young adults that we, we um, tend to see with mental health conditions don't have a lot of work experience and may not have skills because they haven't completed college or um, high school even. So what, the, what this job does is it, it requires numerous skills, but in terms of, um, in terms of uh, qualifications, I mean, usually co even college, completion of college isn't a, um, isn't a requirement or any other certificate necessarily, but it's really having that lived experience um, as a young adult and being able to apply it. So it presents a unique career opportunity for young adults um, to develop their competencies and get into a position 
um, that provides them actually pretty immediate contact with clients. In, I, I talk to clients and in some ways they're getting more immediate contact than people who go for degrees in social work or psychology, where there's more of an internship model. Um, and, you know, it takes a little time to actually be meeting with patients, clients individually. But with peer specialists, um, the whole idea is there's a training once you're hired and then you're pretty quickly working with um, clients or, or people like that. So it is a rare opportunity, not only to as a job and to hold a job, but to advance a career. And from the people I've worked with to help them with this job, I don't see it necessarily, there are multiple tracks career-wise in order to take this job. And it could be that the person wants to be a peer specialist after a while, they want to be more of an advocate, a policy person, or they want to become a social worker. They may decide they want to be a social worker after meeting with clients. So it is a rare opportunity that is held open specifically for young adults um, with mental health conditions. Next slide. Ooh. I don't know how much this crowd is familiar with a peer specialist role, but it is essentially um, a standard role now in, in the country in terms of providing services for people with mental health conditions, as well as people with substance abuse conditions. Although in that model, it, the person with lived experience is referred to as a recovery coach. And that also has been becoming established pretty quickly. Um, 20 years ago, there was really no such thing as a peer specialist or a peer provider. There were, there was, but sporadically. Um, about 15 years ago, Larry Fricks in Georgia um, established an approach in which they were able to get Medicaid reimbursement for um, the use of peer specialists um, because they were able to both train them and certify them. So once you included certification, in the development of this um, uh, profession, they, they were able to get Medicaid reimbursement, which of course is of great interest to providers naturally. You know, we need money to, to, to work. And in short period of time, and you see the map here um, in the darkish blue, I think about every state had a, a training program for peer specialists. Um, and then, and this is about a year old, and then um, in terms of the certification, which is a light blue, every, almost every state had a certification process by which a person would take an exam, um, and not just, you know, as a combination usually of um, didactic questioning and maybe even some having people run through some examples, and people would either pass or fail, but if you passed, um, you could, um, you know, be considered ready to become a peer specialist. The other thing I wanted to mention is that not all states um, use Medicaid as its reimbursably, reimbursable um, insurer. There are some states that pay out of their um, block grant or out of general funds. Um, so not every state uses Medicaid. There's various strategies and reasons, but as long as there's a funding source, um, that's what counts. So again, I'm going to read this definition. A peer specialist is someone in recovery from mental health or substance abuse issues who strategically shares their lived experience with clients to inspire hope, provide emotional support, and aid in developing a recovery plan. Well, that sounds great, doesn't it? I mean, you'd think that everybody would say we should have peer specialists in the system or providers would say, damn, we got to have peer specialists, but it's not that simple. Um, so let's move to the next slide. You know, I want to, I want to make sure that how much time do I have? I lost track of that. Can someone tell me? An hour and a half, John. Okay. So what, what, what time does that end? Um, about 1030. Okay. 1040. 1040. Okay. So, so, here, so one of the key things to understand is what is this job and what differentiates it from other jobs? 
Um, so let me go through through that because there are unique qualities and practices of the peer specialist, or at least fairly unique to very unique. Let's first talk about disclosure. And I know there must be clinicians um, on the call here who may or may not have various opinions of dis using disclosure in your own practice to connect with clients because the, the ethical codes generally allow for disclosure, um, but it's not considered required for the practice of psychiatry, social work, and psychology. Um, as long as it's used towards helping the person improve their, their, their um, mental health or engage in recovery. So in some cases, and it doesn't have to be about one's mental illness. It could be, you know, about one's experience with another disease or illness. And, and um, you know, I have, diabetes, I have diabetes and it's difficult to maintain because it's chronic. And, you know, that might be one way of trying to connect with a, a um, client who's also dealing with a chronic condition and needs to spend a lot of time um, working on it through screening and medication. So that's one thing that um, therapists may or may not do, um, depending on what school of thought they come through. Um, it's another step, perhaps, I suppose, to start to share about your one's mental health condition as a therapist. I mean, I'm not a therapist, but I, I would, I think I'd probably be cautious about um, sharing too much about my personal mental health. Um, and I know it's not required that I have to use it, but if it were to help me connect with somebody, and I do this now as a vocational specialist, I use my own lived experience and looking for jobs or um, and trying to find jobs and working that I, I think in a lot of cases, if I use it carefully, it does help me connect um, more so with the client. So for example, if someone's having trouble looking for work, I might say, you know, I went through a period and I don't, where, where I also had trouble for work and I understand how discouraging that is and where you're coming from. So that's, not lived experience of mental illness, but it does sort of create this peerness where you and the other person share something and that can create a, a be, the beginning of a, a, a good bond. So the difference with peer specialists is they, they, they are required to be able to use their experience of mental health challenges um, strategically. So it's not something a person comes in and tell, tells the client, you know, but guess what? Let me tell you my recovery story. It, it, you use it strategically when it helps build a connection with somebody. Again, it may be helping a, a client address a certain frustration have. They have are sharing a strategy that you as a mental health person, mental health uh, client had uh, used to help the person think through their own um, recovery. So the, the issue here is disclosure in here is an inherent part of the job. Whereas with other um, professions, it may or may not be um, used, but it, it's certainly not an inherent part of the job. So that's the unique quality we have there. Um, the second one is that as people in recovery, the peer providers are role models and exemplars. And this one is straightforward because if you're a client working with a peer specialist, a peer, a peer provider, you know that person has struggled with mental health conditions and is now working in, living in society. So by definition, that person is someone who may have been where you are now, or probably was where you are now as a person with mental health condition. It can be very inspiring to see people who have been there who are now functioning. Um, I think as I talk about later, what I've seen out there for a lot of clients is they're hopeless. They, um, they're hope meaning, I shouldn't, let me rephrase that. They, 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 um, they don't feel hope. They feel like they're stuck in this situation, maybe in a day program and everyone else is sick and they and they feel sick. Um, and then one day they come across a peer, peer provider who says, look at, I did it. You can, you can do it too. And here's what I'm doing. That, that can really generate pretty instant possibility and hope with a client. 
Um, so again, this role model um, piece is really important. Third is that it's really important for a peer specialist to make sure that the client's voice is part of any treatment planning or um, that sort of thing, including promoting the idea that clients could be at meetings where they're talking about this or to make sure their voice is being heard. Um, fourth, and this is a, the, advocating for the, oh, fourth, I'm sorry, engaging in mutuality. So I don't know if people know what mutuality is, but to me, it's a state of mind. I know it is for me in whatever I do. Um, it means that to me, that while I as a employment specialist or clinician, I feel like I have something to offer, but I also feel like I can get something positive out of a, a relationship with a, with a um, client, that I'm gonna get something out of this too. And therefore it's, shared, it's a shared benefit. And it humble, it makes me in some ways more humble. Um, because when I, when I work with, with, with young adults, um, and, and I'm offering them um, support and they thank me. I think that I'm generally thankful to them too because I'm learning something about them and I'm teaching, I'm learning something about myself perhaps in, in further helping them. I mean, every opportunity I feel like for me is a way to learn about myself. So I will thank them too for helping me learn how to be a better vocational specialist. But it's, it's really the attitude of it's, it's not hierarchical necessarily it's that we are in this together um we are both getting something out of this so you know i'm gonna i'm humble about this and you know it presents an attitude where we're pre in the past it's been this professional attitude the doc is always right um and clients are not this is in all fields but i think we've moved away from that direction the peer specialist takes it you know, to, to, um, to a largest degree of this piece of mutuality. And finally, and I'll refer to culture a lot, um, part of the reason we have a peer specialist is we hope that the peer specialist with their um, different kinds of approaches will introduce a more different thinking around how clients are, are dealt with. Um, particularly promoting a more youth development recovery oriented approach. So I'll talk about that in a few minutes. One thing to think about is that this, um, this job is fairly new, including the, the peer, peer provider generally, about 20 years old. So nurses and psychiatrists and psychologists have been around much longer and they have um, various histories that allow them to analyze what they should be doing right now. And we're, we're doing that in the peer community, but it's been only 20 years and we're all trying to learn how best to implement it. It's like any innovation, any innovation is going to um, impact and make people feel uncomfortable. And that's just the fact with any innovation and this is an innovation. Um, it really does change the thinking of how services should be provided. And I think that's what we're hoping for. Great. Ne next slide, please. Well, there are proven benefits to having a good young adult peer specialist who's integrated into the treatment team. All right. So, so remember that when we think of a young adult peer specialist, not every young adult with a mental health condition is going to have the qualities and requirements to be a good peer specialist. Talk about that. I talk about that later. And second, for that person to be effective, they really do need to be integrated into um, a treatment team and working well with the other treatment team members. And we'll talk about that later too. But assuming for now that we have that, um, the young adult peer provider produces improved engagement, um, it's been shown that clients who are also young adults are more likely to trust the, um, the provider or otherwise build, start to build a relationship with somebody towards building it with other um, um, clinicians, with clinicians through, through just what we talked about, the mutuality, the use of own story, that starts to build um, 
uh, engagement towards using clinical services more. Um, it's been shown that clients are more satisfied for the most part if there is a peer specialist present. Um, it's, it's an outlet, it's someone to talk to and feel like you're not gonna be judged. The outcomes are also pretty well um, established at this time. And I talked about generating hope at rock bottom. This is what I see constantly um, in, in the use of, in, in working with peers. They really do sh exemplify the possibility of recovery. Reduced symptoms and rehospitalizations have also been shown to be um, an outcome of the use of peers. Um, you know, some practical reasons for that. One is if someone says they need, may, they might need to be hospitalized, a peer might be aware of other possible um, uh, places where the person can go and other things they can do to maintain their wellness. Improved well-being, self-esteem, and social functioning, and improved educational process. And the latter is really important for our group because the young adults, by definition, are for the most part, have some involvement in education, whether it be finishing their GED, going to college, et cetera. And when you have peer providers who have been through that, who have gone through the GED, gone through college and struggled through that and, and gotten to a point where they may have graduated, they are very, they have very good practical advice, but are also inspirational in that they have done this and they will support the person to do so. And then again, we'll get into the organizational culture again, but our hope is that um, the presence of young adults will improve culture. So I just wanted to touch base quickly. Let me just pull this out of my other notes here. Um, let me see. All right, so um, our young adult peer had some, I think, important ideas on other benefits and his question was why is the peer role important for the future um and as we discussed one reason is that this is a unique and still a relatively new role and there's a lot of providers who might be frustrated or with getting through this and hiring people and maybe having to let people go and it not working out but we have to keep this in context. This is what happens with any innovation. And if we see the benefits to this, it's worth continuing to work at. Um, second is it gives a certain sense of independence to um, clients that is refreshing and empowering. So I think our hope is that these young adults can be independent in the community and, um, you know, peer specialists can contribute to um, that development through showing people what it takes to be independent in the community. They can give a realistic um, modeling of what it takes to kind of move from the mental health system into more of the world of um, life and um, jobs, housing, and, we know that's not easy. It's just not easy for, for that transition to happen, but the peer can be very um, down to earth on so, the sort of greediness and effort it takes to do that. Um, yeah, so, so those are like, the other thing is, it, as I mentioned earlier, it's an opportunity for work for young adults where they might not be qualified for other kinds of jobs. And again, not every young adult with mental health condition is uh, made for this job um, and the provider has to be good at hiring but assuming that um, this is a, another incredibly important role um, in clinical mental health clinical efforts and although you know and it's becoming well established as a profession so uh, next slide please all right so so when the peer role was developed in the adult system, um, it was seen as trying to promote a system that hadn't existed called recovery-oriented services. 
um, something that's still fairly new going back to um, um, the 2000s. I'll do a little history here. But back in the 1990s, um, you know, seclusion and restraint was seen as a treatment. <laughs> um, that's not the case anymore, but there was definitely a different set of thinking around how clients of any age should be treated and that involved fo meaning following the program no matter what personal needs they had um, and really working on um, their hallucinations or, or um, other things like that to the without thinking about the future and the idea is they probably couldn't work ever so people began to see that the system was really lacking and providing opportunities for growth for clients. So this notion of recovery oriented services started in, in, and in 2004, the President's New Freedom Commission was passed under George W. Bush, which really has required grants from the federal government and even state government now to be more recovery oriented. So the peer specialist role is consistent with recovery oriented services, but often what we see with providers is they're not fully recovery oriented or only partly recovery oriented. And this is important because to the degree that they aren't recovery oriented, there could be some disagreements or conflict with the peer specialist. So let's just, this is important to understand. So let's just go through this. So recovery oriented services, and I'm sorry if I'm speaking to the, um, to people who already know this, but I'll, I'll, I'll be um, quick with this. But uh, so historically, believe it or not, services are based on the program model. So you'd go to a day treatment program and you would attend groups and there was not a lot of thought giving to what the individual needs are. Not like um, ACT teams, for example, now really give a lot of thought, assertive community treatment, really give a lot of thought to the needs of the individual. So I think that's been more or less a successful change in how services are provided. Strengths-based, not deficit-based. So in the old days, um, and they still do this, you would come in and they would find out what you're struggling with, hallucinations, um, paranoia, and focus only on that, um, which was not very engaging for the client and could be depressing just to talk about that. Now in the days, it also is consistent with the youth development model, is that while a deficit could be addressed, we should also be addressing a person's strengths because the strengths help people sort of claw their way forward. And it may be that um, a person is especially good at, at math and um, maybe we use that to help them get, get a training or a job that they'd like. But we want to recognize what they're really good at. Um, Third, active participation in treatment decision making. So this was, again, something that was scattershot in the past, and it's probably still is still scattershot today. I would say, um, how you incorporate the client into decision making has proven to be very difficult. But um, one of the things that comes out of this is the notion of self determination and dignity of risk. So self determination means that an adult has the right to make their own decisions, whether they're good decisions or bad decisions. And dignity of risk is that a person is allowed to, we all take risks to various degrees um, in terms of trying something new or getting a motorcycle or whatnot. And we presumably learn from, you know, either succeeding or, or not succeeding. And that's what recovery oriented services see for young adults. So the best example I've seen, well, the most common example is around medications, where a young adult might say, you know, I've heard about this, I just don't want to take these, I want to try something else. And, you know, the clinician who is not recovery oriented would say, nope, this is how it's going to be. So that's not consistent with recovery oriented services. There has to be some sort of discussion. And ultimately, and legally, it is up to the adults to decide what they're going to do with medications. And a good clinician, I think, would stay with the person. And it may be that the person without medications after a period of time does poorly and comes back to the psychiatrist and says, you know, I've learned my lesson. I've seen that a lot. And 
people learn by personal experience more than by lectures from other people. So this is a touchy area because the risk could be considered too high. Um, but the peer specialist will always promote self-determination. And I think it's up to the team to understand that there is tension between um, safety and health, healthcare, um, positive health versus self-determination sometimes. So that just has to be recognized. There's no easy solution to that. Community integrated, meaning not live in hospitals, but live in housing in the community um, that is fairly independent, that a person has a chance to break free of group homes and live in their own with support. And vocational services um, also to promote independence towards competitive employment, which means employment that um, typically other people have um, so that you're not, you're not in a sheltered workshop, but you're competing with other people. And it's um, a positive notion that, that people who become community integrated can advance themselves financially so that they're no longer dependent on, say, social security um, or other um, benefits. And, th and therefore, they have a chance to grow beyond where they are and maybe become self financially self-sufficient and even develop some level of wealth. So um, that's the, I think we really hope. And I can say that I can say for myself and for other people with mental health conditions that there are times when we've looked like a wreck and no one could have predicted that we um, went beyond that. So that's something to keep in mind. And the peer specialist knows that because that person has been through a lot. So just the other point to this is that clinical care is more seen as symptom management and stability. And we know it's more than that, but that's typically, in my experience, been the, been the key features of it. And um, it's very difficult to, to um, make that consistent with the notions of recovery-oriented services. It never will be, but it's important for the people involved in introducing this to understand that there is this tension and the tension should be recognized and it can be dealt with. All right, next slide, please. Right, workplace challenges. So this is the, this is the um, part of the big thing for us to understand. Um, and that it's important if once a provider recognizes workplace challenges, that's a big step forward. Um, I'll just keep going because it's not easy. You don't just slip someone into a position and think it's all just going to happen. It's a new position um, in general. It's a new position perhaps in the program and other staff are going to wonder what is going on here. So quickly I'll go through these six um, uh, challenges and then move on to hopefully some of the solutions. Well, not many people know what this job is. Um, you know, not meaning other, other staff in particular, but even most people in the organization. It's just not clear on what the unique challenges this is and how it is there to complement other roles, not to take the place of other roles. Um, so whenever there's this confusion about a new staff person, there can be a sense of alienation and sometimes hostility. So we can address that. Um, number two is the organizational culture clash, which is probably the most common um, challenge that can be addressed here. And we talked about in the previous slide, clinical versus recovery oriented, for example, stability versus self-determination um, growth. And I'm not gonna say either one is valid or invalid, but discussions about this can only happen if people understand both um, theories. Role di diminishment, I will talk about that in a second. That's what can happen when these um, um, cultures are not understood. Recruitment and hiring, that's hard. Um, Supervision is not always um, on point, and sometimes when people with mental health conditions have troubles with the job, 
it's less clear what to do because they may also be having trouble with their illnesses or symptoms. And it's just totally unclear what to do. And we can talk about how to address that. You know, young adult peers almost by definition are not experienced in work and they may have health difficulties. So that places, I'll just say an extra burden on the employer is in terms of helping the person understand what it means to work. Um, not all the people that I work with have role models. A lot of them come from single parent families who have demonstrated what it means to work. So that's going to be frustrating for the employer if, um, you know, you, you hire someone like that. But there are ways we can deal with that too. And finally, um, there are wellness approaches that can help um, young adult peers, including coaching, whether it be paid for coaching or some sort of mentoring from another employee. Um, but, you know, it's hard enough to work in, in healthcare, in mental health care. So think about what it might be like for a young person with a mental health condition who is new to their job and working in a very difficult job. So we have to address that. Next slide, please. Um, all right, so there's an answer to this. Um, and it's pretty broad based and a lot of this is covered in the toolkit, most of it is. But number one, it seem, would seem would be obvious, but I have found it not to be, but that is define and clarify the peer role for all staff before actually hiring the person. Sometimes I've seen providers try to hire someone um, without knowing what the job is, believe it or not. And make sure you're in good with HR, human resources. Make sure that they understand what you're doing before you hire because the peer role really deserves its own sort of classification. It just doesn't match other jobs. And when providers have had to do that and try to get after hiring someone and working with the HR, it just doesn't work. But you know, we'll get into that in a second, but you already know the new, unique qualities. So part of that is talking to human resources about what it's going to mean to hire someone like that. Enhance the organization's capacity to recruit and hire peer specialists, get into that. Um, promote workplace place culture that supports peer um, specialists, which is recovery oriented and a youth development approach. A youth development approach really does try to um, build positivity in someone and um, um, have the person with those executive functionings. I think the aim there is executive functioning skills so that young people can plan and follow up on their own projects or homeworks or whatever that they're not always dependent to think through the future with um, another person that youth development pr promotes, I think, empowerment for young adults in skill building. Establish effective supervisory practices, again, addressing job difficulties. This mostly mirrors the previous slide, but not completely. So for example, number five is really preparing and engaging non-peer staff. You know, think about it. You have this person comes in. You don't know if there's going to be more of those people, peer specialists, and if they're going to take your jobs. No one's told you how you're supposed to work with that group. And that's really unfair to other staff because you know, they, they, how are they supposed to know how to work with peers if they don't know what the position is? Um, finally, promote employee wellness, resilience, and self-care. And this is really um, a corporate kind of approach referred to universal design. So the question is, what wellness supports are there available to all staff? Um, you know, it, it, we have... Um, you know, and some, some organizations do it differently, but they may have um, offered Tai Chi or something like that. And they offer these opportunities, but it doesn't have to be focused on the person with the mental illness, but what is the wellness culture in a sense uh, of a workplace? Um, so those six things are the things we need to look into. So let's continue. Trying to see if there's any questions. Um, okay. So, <clears throat> Let's take a cup of coffee here. So how, how to um, <clears throat> define and clarify the role before hiring with HR. So <clears throat> the first thing is to know what the unique qualities of this position are. Because you're going to have to talk to HR about that and explain to them why 
disclosure is important and in, in that it doesn't necessarily violate discrimination laws just because we're looking for someone with a certain condition. There, in the toolkit, I think I have some citations to some federal regulations that show that you can ask for people with disabilities in the job, um, but you have to come with that ammo when you meet with HR. And HR in general, you know, they're just trying to do their job. They don't want to be surprised naturally. So uh, this is this um, gets you f further there. Now you describe the key functions of the position. Now this may differ depending on on the job. So we know there are peer navigators, um, peer bridgers, helping housing housing support people, and, and people being on assertive community treatment teams, which um, you know it, it involves other aspects. So some of the peer roles are more specific. So if you're a bridger, you're helping people get out of hospitals and into the community. Um, so you want to be clear in your job on your job notice that that's what that is. Um, if you're a navigator, it might be more broad in helping people negotiate the system and um, get to the services they want. But you want to be clear on that's the role. It's not something else. And after that, excuse me, you establish the job qualifications. Um, compensation and career growth opportunities because a lot of providers do this and they do this with their other staff so why not do this with a peer specialist too i'll, I'll go through job qualifications in a second um let me let me say an example of a job qualification often is is taking and passing a peer certification class um but sometimes the often the employer will hire someone on the condition that they'll take that class and and the employer will pay for that so that's an example of a job qualification in that if you take this position you will take this training and pass pass this exam if you want to um that's a qualification for, for this job another example of a qualification is lived experience of mental health um substance abuse now compensation is a big issue um, you know, peer specialists usually don't get paid as much as, um, other professionals and that's okay, I guess, but they should be paid at a rate in which you want to attract people. If you, if, the more you pay, the better people you're going to get. That's the rule. So in terms of whatever the position is, you want, you want to be thoughtful in terms of the supply and demand, and it may take more money to get the best people. Career growth is, is of course, important to young people and to, to build that in, whether it be support financially for classes or, um, you know, what, what other opportunities down the road there are is important to a young person. So we're not dealing with just a young person with a mental illness, but someone who's starting their career. So keep that in mind when, when you build up your, um, your job. And finally, a written clear job description of the role. So, all right. Um, next slide, please. So, so when you're hiring, you know, and you might be having interviews, you want to know what to look for in a person. And, you know, th this here lists at least the first five bullets. Some of the key characteristics and qualities of someone that you know are consistent with recovery oriented care um you want someone in generally who, who who holds hope and believes that people can get better um you want someone who values you know the the potential to make make your own choices um and who can stand up for people um being served in a respectful way in terms of treatment team meetings it's a tough job. I mean, it's really interesting to me that we have young people going going into it, and they're expected to manage conflict, um, um, understand culture change, and that's why I'm sort of going off a little bit here. We 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 need management to understand this and provide supports for this difficult job. Um, and as I said, they value the peer role is not clinical to augment the clinical services. So again, it's not meant to duplicate or to challenge. 
in, in the jobs. It's there to create discussion, just like any, when any individual from a diverse group is brought in, it's often hoped and expected that they can challenge the prevailing culture. And that's true here too. We know that's extremely difficult, uh, but that's an important quality to, to try to manage that without um, too much emotional stress. They recognize the peer for what they are and um, can describe what a recovery oriented system here. So I added two things here that I have on my slides that come up in terms of qualities. And one is, criminal history, and the second is being a former program client. So with regard to criminal history, I have in the toolkit a pretty extensive discussion about this. And let's just say that I, I, I don't think criminal history should disqualify anybody, depending on what it is, I guess, from being a peer specialist. In fact, sometimes they're trying to hire for a forensic peer specialist. That's someone who by definition does have a criminal history. So one kind of way of thinking you may want to give is how do we hire someone with a criminal history when there's pressure not to? And in the toolkit, I go into to more detail. I don't have time except to say that legally employers are not supposed to ask about criminal history early in the hiring process because that can prejudice you as an employer and it's something you want to go you want to go through the hiring process and then at the end ask about criminal history by that time you know comfortably about the person and you haven't been prejudiced by by that background and you can make a determination as to whether this person is the, the right person to hire. Now, granted, there are some criminal histories that's gonna, that are gonna disqualify somebody and, and, and that'll come out. But, um, but if, we are, if we know about a, a criminal history from the beginning of the hiring process, we're always gonna have a look at with a scan set at the person and, and as if they have to prove themselves. That's why on, on job notices, I would never say, for the most part, I wouldn't say you need to um, pass a criminal history check because that could draw away everybody with a criminal history, I mean, a push away, when in fact we are hiring people with criminal histories. So this is described in the toolkit. The other thing you can do is if a person has a record, you can help them expunge the record or seal the record. And, um, and that which would make them eligible for hiring. So this is, this is an extensive issue that's um, plagued um, our society for quite a while because, you know, criminal histories are, are dis, are dis, have disparate impact on people who are African-American, people with mental health conditions. So the Department of Justice has its eye out on this. And um, I would encourage, people to look at the toolkit before disqualifying people with um, criminal histories. All right, so what do you do with a former program client who applies for a job? Next slide. This is, this is the one I pulled out just as um, how I think about things, I think it shows. So when, I, when, I, when, when someone says a, 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 pro, a former program client wants to work here, my, I have to admit, my, um, my antenna goes way up and I say, holy moly, what's going to happen because this person might know other people here or whatnot. But then really the first thought should be, what are the benefits of having a former program client in, um, in a program? And there are some really strong benefits because that person is going to know exactly how to negotiate complex treatment and, vocation, and the vocational system of support in that specific geographic area with these specific clients. I mean, you have someone who's gonna be instantly able to help other peers. Second, that person is direct evidence of recovery because of the program that um, the client is in. So there are some strong reasons, I think, that support having a former client in that peer role. And then I asked the question, well, why not? Why? What's the argument to to not have that person? I mean, or is it just theoretical? Why not have a clinician and former client working on the same team, for example? Um, so pause for for thought there. Why not? Think about that. Um, that I'm that I'm. Sometimes people will say it's an ethical issue, 
but I don't know what they mean by an ethical issue. I mean, the client, it's okay with the client to work with the former clinician. They're not saying I can't work with my former clinician. So then it must be the clinician who's uncomfortable with it or the team. But I don't, I don't see it as an ethical issue. I think sometimes people throw them, that out when they feel uncomfortable as clinicians. For me, it's more of a management issue because it isn't a good idea in all cases. Um, now, we know that if a peer specialist is working on the same team as his or her former therapist, there could be some discomfort. And that's something I would want to explore with the team um, early on as something just we should consider as a team. Do we want to hire pro former program clients? Why, why not? That's something to include in, in some general discussions. Now, otherwise, there are reasons I wouldn't hire a former client. One is if they um, haven't been out for a while. Like if they still have, if they have a lot of relationships with other clients, I probably wouldn't hire them. That, that, that feels like a, a, a conflict for me that, um, you know, if, if, if they've been away from the program for two years, I don't think I, I would worry about hiring them. But if they've only been out of the program for three months, I might have my concerns. And then regardless, like anything, if they have existing relationships with clients, I would be concerned about hiring them. But this is something, you know, it's, in other words, this is an issue that shouldn't just be slammed down yes or no, but it should be thought through carefully to see if, um, it makes sense to, to hire a former client. Um, all right, let's go to the next one. One second here. Can we go to the next slide? I'm gonna come back to this one. Can we come to the next slide? All right. <clears throat> now, if I were to give one piece of advice, or maybe one out of three pieces of advice to um, all of you, you know, it would be that every staff member should know what this job is, the peer role, and what are the opportunities within the organization. So let's face it, in adult, at least adult services, peer specialists are there in many programs. So we kind of know what a nurse does. We kind of know what a social worker does. We have to know what a peer specialist does. Now, that should be valued in the, in the provider group. And if every staff member knows this, they are all potential recruiters for the role. The example I always think about is if, um, you know, you're, you're a uh, staff account at a, at a holiday party somewhere and someone else says, you know, my son's been struggling with mental health conditions, he can't get a job. You might say, you know, we have a, we have a p position potentially at our provider for people that you're like your son. So I think we know that a lot of jobs are obtained through just connections, but if we can't describe the job to people who may be interested in it, then it's gonna be a lot harder. So there has to be sort of a unitary educational process um, for all staff. So that's one of the things I'd really like to leave you with. Um, requires a clear job description and maybe some educational sessions and workshops on what this job is. Um, throughout the organization. Excuse me. More or less um, common sense. Colleges, um, we've hired, well, at UMass, we've hired a number of people who are in college and out of college, and some have moved on to get a master's degree um, by looking at, at the campuses. And, you know, it's not all that easy to get jobs, and people are more open now to working as peers, and sometimes that's a higher paying job that they can get elsewhere. Um, so people in campuses could see this as an opportunity. And it's good to, to, and it is an opportunity, it is good to consider your college campuses. I know in Boston, where I am, there's a lot of colleges to recruit from, it's kind of figuring out which ones, but we have social work colleges, just liberal arts, um, pub, public health. And, um, but you know, like any other kind of recruiting, it takes time to build those connections. Now, there are organizations offering the first peer certification classes and it's worth contacting any group doing peer related um, classes because they know who's graduating, they know where people live 
and they can suggest you talk to somebody, perhaps. Um, now there are agencies that offer vocational services, and I'm one of those people in a program, and I, saw, I, I at times have people who want to become paraspecialists. Um, and I wish a provider would come to me and say, look, it, we'd like to consider the people that you're supporting, um, and you can support them when they get the job. So the, the idea is if they do become a peer specialist, I as a vocational counselor can continue to support them, which is a benefit to the provider. It's less for them. So that's why it's good to look at agencies that offer vocational services. There are people who are ready to work but can't find something. Um, the link to the peer job application is not clear. So it, it's the effort of the provider to do the recruiting. Mental health programs that have young adult clients, um, that's not the best necessarily place because people are still perhaps struggling in their treatment, but a lot of people in these programs are already, um, such as the program I work at, already looking for work and they're beginning to manage their, their care. Conferences and workshops specifically for peers, um, they're out there and you know, you might want to have someone go who is from human, not from human resources, but who's interested in um, hiring. I know a lot of people have been hired um, through this, through getting to know people somewhere else. And then the online job boards are okay. You'll catch a few people that way. But boy, if you could do every one of these things as a recruiter, you'll find somebody. I often hear people saying we can't recruit, but I don't think they're doing, I don't, I think they think they're, using the same methods they use to hire other professions, but there's more effort required here. So, all right, next slide, please. I'm, I'm sorry, go, if you can go back to our training, back a slide. All right, so again, as I said, peers, young adult peers coming with less experience, maybe with um, pretty good stability, but not great, they need support, and many of them don't have work role models. So to a certain degree, the provider would be smart to take on some of this, um, this training and education, or at least outsource it or know about programs that offer it. So soft skills, professionalism, um, you know, how you talk to people, these are things people don't naturally come in with, a lot of people. Um, how you listen and um, things of that nature. So it could be like one short session on professionalism or, or, or soft skills. Then I call the hard skills. And this is something I've been frustrated with as a um, employer because I know, you know, I don't know how I, I learned this stuff, but when I was growing up um, or at least starting to work, the, there were, better ways of contacting people with information. And I think email has messed that up. I don't know, I get emails and what I'm looking for isn't until the bottom of the page. People will say, see below. And that's very confusing to, to me as a recipient. So what I encourage people to do, for example, is to write memos. People remember memos, we don't see them much anymore, but to, from, regarding, date, and, and use that to explain um, why you want to do something, why you're doing something, um, some research you may have conducted, but memos are kind of forever and emails are sort of forever, but memos really, um, you, you, you place in one area, what the question is and what your response is as, as a um, peer specialist or other peer provider or anybody else. So we have an, one, an example on Appendix D in a toolkit. But I really do think people, it's such a different era now than many years ago that I think people have lost some good communication skills. As I said, texting, email is just so all over the place. We need it in, in one place once in a while. People will need help with personnel policies and benefits. This is new to people. I mean, you know, they may have, I just have someone who joined a company and he, um, he automatically has union representation and he, he's involuntarily paying out of pocket to get that, which is, which is an okay thing, but it kind of threw him off a little bit. And I had to explain to them some background on this, but you know, people should get um, 
provided with an understanding of why this happens. Uh, personal policies, workplace rights and responsibilities, um, such as the Americans with Disabilities Act, and how you can build resilience through stress management, self-care and wellness planning. Um, and then the, and any staff trainings should include the peer specialist. So let's move on to the next slide. Oh, that's next slide after that. Oh, no, no, that was good. Um, yeah, great. So this, this is kind of like, all right, we're going to hire peer specialists, but our culture is, is still clinical. We still have people here who believe that pay clients don't recover or that it, it, um, they shouldn't work unless they're perfectly stable, which goes against the recovery oriented culture in support of employment that any person should be able to work on getting a competitive job. Um, so we may have people here still like that. It may be, um, and it's understandable why they believe that way because that's how they were trained or that's their, it's a, it makes sense to them. But we as an organization need to begin to change that in order to give everybody a chance. So I go into a much more detail in the toolkit about establishing a culture, but these are just like the basic components. And if you don't have this, it's gonna be really hard, but it starts with a committed and strong leadership team, meaning the CEO of the organization. That person, their people not only need to believe in it, but show show that they believe in it, whether it be in writing stories or giving talks um, about it frequently or joining committees on young adult peers. That can make a big difference to the um, rest of the organization that the CEO is serious about this and it's going to last. It's not just going to be like a six month initiative. Um, so the, the leadership need to say that. This is, this is our future. Um, this is where we're going. Communications. You know, the best communications um, I've seen is when a person who didn't believe in the peer role at one point became a believer in the peer role once they hired someone. And they can explain why. So people who are, who are um, who adapted after fighting it can often ex will, will explain to you why this is good and why they why their concerns were not as important as they thought. So um, there are memos. There's this there's email um, list that we, the organization can send out valuing it, but um, there have to be communications either publicly could be publicly public talks on the peer role. Are, are privately within the organization. And we talked about human resources, um, effective staff hiring and, and accountability practices. So this is this is for both the peer specialist and other other uh, staff. Um, you know, we we the organization has to demonstrate that other staff are being assessed based on in part how they work with the peer and how they treat the peer, as well as other staff. Um, and then being held accountable for, for not doing that. So in terms of your evaluation process of, of, of staff, there should be something in there about um, ability to work with peer, encouraging to work with peer, or strives to work well with the peer specialist. And then um, finally, and this is done in a number of organizations, you may want peer specialists in management roles or at, or at um, are um, executive roles. So in some organizations, there are vice presidents of recovery who are also vice presidents of peer specialists. And if they have a direct link to the CEO, they will have more influence than um, other places and they can generate thinking that supports the peer role, whether it be how can we become more recovery oriented or how we can provide better training. So in some organizations, all the peer specialists report up the line to the vice president of Peer, um, peer support or recovery. And that's proven to be um, useful. At the same time, people might be reporting to their treatment team too. But I, with, with a peer specialist at a higher level, you can organize the trainings with all the peer specialists in the organization. It can be pretty efficient too. Um, you know, we may have, like for example, we have vice presidents of, of 
psychiatry, vice presidents of nursing, you know, vice presidents of peer specialists uh, form a similar function of organizing um, standards and practices for this role in the organization and um, in being very organized about it. And it can be an empowering peer feeling for a peer to, you know, have an opportunity to talk to other peer specialists. But the bottom line is having a peer in a VP role or something to that extent signals the importance of the, the job. And um, second, the peer is going to have direct good ideas to help influence the organization to make the role more comfortable for the um, peer specialist. All right, so let's go to the next slide. I talked about role diminishment. Um, well, let's, this is a big concern for consumers and peers. Um, and the reason it comes up here is because when the culture is not positive towards peer specialists, when it's more, um, when it doesn't support recovery, but instead focuses on stabilizing people and staying on their meds, whatever they are, and, and, and not working, um, it can feel hostile to the peer because their job, they don't feel like they're doing their job if they can't, if they work in, in um, a provider world that is in, in opposition to their beliefs and they don't feel like they're, they're, they're contributing a lot. It can be very disheartening, very disheartening. Um, one of the things that happens as this happens is, as I said, what I call role diminishment, where they're given tasks to do that have nothing to do with what the peer specialist role. Um, they're given it because either it needs to get done or they're, they're, they're the, the aspects of the role that are important, advocating for the voice of the client are minimized. So here's what ha happens sometimes. Um, and and I, I should say this too. I think, you know, to the degree that other staff are asked to do things, you know, a peer specialist can be asked to do things too. I think I, know, I as a team member am okay with stepping up and doing things that, like as a vocational specialist, I, I went with clients to a reach some um, park and um, it may have had nothing to do with my job, but I know it contributed to the team. But, and I, and I felt like the team understood that this was, um, you know, n not, not my job, but it was something I was willing to do. And I think we want to step up for the team, but sometimes the diminishment can be institutionalized. So they might have the person drive a bus every day and do filing and med delivery um, or clean the person's apartment. This is not the role of the peer and it takes away from what they're supposed to be doing. Um, you know, it can be an us and them, um, feeling between peers and staff if this issue is not addressed. Um, and then peers are not invited to participate in policy making for the organization. They're just kind of left out and left hanging and they, it's a very lonely feeling. Um, so peer specialists can have most influence on organization and planning when they make up a significant portion of the provider workforce. So in a provider group, you, you wouldn't hopefully have just one peer, about 10, 20, 30 peers, and it becomes more relevant. It's important for the peer to be educated on what best and evidence-based practices are, such as supportive employment or cognitive behavioral therapy, so that they can, they can comment on that. They, they should be educated like any other person. It's good if peers are active on committees and work groups, and as I said earlier on organizational leadership roles, again, change is more likely to happen when you put a minority group in a role of power. And, um, and, and the organization needs to decide if they are changing culture, because if they aren't, I would tell the team, maybe you shouldn't hire a peer. Um, maybe it's not gonna work out unless you commit to some change. Um, so, you know, role diminishment is, is, is a terrible feeling. It's like you've gone through this training, you have these skills, and then they're having you, um, you know, just do basic things like, like any, like, you know, people who are less educated in a sense. So let's not do that, okay? All right, next slide, please. All right, so, this is always the question, and in my research, it came up that 
supervision, and I've seen this in most research, supervision is one of the major keys to success for the young adult peer. Um, I would also argue that the things previously mentioned around role definition, um, clarity, and um, culture are also very important, but, but clients, well, I'm sorry, what peer specialists see most when they're working is their supervisor. Hopefully they see that person. So myself, other people in particular have developed um, a, a list of important items to consider. Our toolkit goes into greater detail um, primarily through Vanessa Klodnik, who's even written a, um, another toolkit on supervision. And the link, I think the link is on the slides here, it might have fallen off, but I personally think that, you know, one issue is whether a person is a good supervisor. I mean, let's face it, there are some people who are better supervisors than others in, in general. I mean, a lot of the standard practices of good supervision apply here too. So part of it is, as a peer worker, are you getting a good supervisor? And, you know, but nevertheless, there are some important things relevant to this job that are very important. And this number one is, you'll, you'll see it as a theme throughout my discussion. And that is the peer, the supervisor needs to know what the job is and believe in the role. I think that just makes sense, right? They, they only can help people if they understand the job, why it's there and believe in it. Um, otherwise, it's, it's, it's just not going to work. Um, and maybe, you know, I'll scroll down to, um, uh, let's see, the, um, let's give me a second here, reflective supervision number four. So reflective, so let's say the, the, the um, supervisor doesn't totally understand that. Reflective supervision allows the, the peer and the supervisor to together um, in more of a mutual way share what the supervision should look like given um, what the job is. And this is an opportunity for the supervisor to really learn about the job from the um, client, from the, I'm sorry, from the, from the peer specialist. Also, in a number of states require this, that they require that supervisors attend trainings and become certified in being um, supervisors of peer specialists. So there's a wide recognition that that needs to happen. Classic working alliance, I mean, like in any supervision, teaching, I mean, even though you may not be an expert at a peer specialist role, you, if you understand the job, you can relate it to other things you've done as a social worker or a nurse, where things have been tricky around boundaries, things of that nature. You are teaching a bit, again, because these young adults are new and may or may not have had this job before. So there's a strong teaching component, um, that shouldn't be minimized. Clear expectations. Um, on in the two biggest things that come up are around disclosure and boundaries. Disclosure, you know, we've talked about using that strategically. So um, that that that's something I won't go into in detail here, but I'd be concerned if a client, if a peer is going around telling his or her life story to every every peer they're working with, because that's not what disclosure is about. It's, you know, one of the key, I didn't, I don't think I've said this yet, yet, but one of the key characteristics of a good peer specialist is sort of quietude, willing to listen, not being not dominant, and um, just being, you know, being more or less laid back. Um, that's as important as they need disclosure. And boundaries, um, won't go into here, but there are, most organizations have rules on boundaries. Um, there are some tricky ones in the peer role, and I should say that most states have code of ethics. Massachusetts has a, has a code of ethics, so I would refer to that. If Ohio doesn't have one, I can send you the Massachusetts one, but you probably do. So it's important to understand the code of ethics. Men talk about reflective supervision, which is really trying to understand the peer's perspective and sort of build there. I, I really believe that meetings should happen individually on a regular basis. I'm convinced of this. Even if the meetings might be short, um, I can tell you 
if you're working in rehab on a clinical team or as a peer, you can feel so isolated so quickly. Um, it happens. So that's important. Um, it's important that the supervisor be an advocate for the peer. So what we hear is sometimes the supervisor will be around other people who make fun of the peer job and the supervisor says, look it, I work with someone and it works. That should be like a key aspect of the job of a supervisor is you know, advocating for that role. Um, well, we see job performance difficulties in, in a lot of areas, but we see them in this area too. So how do we address them? And I'm gonna give you one way I've done that I've taught to people that's worked out pretty well, but you know, by definition, peer specialists are people with disabilities according to the Americans with Disabilities Act, just because they have a history of it. They may be, even if they're functional now, by having a history, they, they have a disability. So, so how do you help a person with a disability do better in the job? And we have this notion of, called reasonable accommodations, which let's go to the next slide. And I, I imagine people are familiar with this. Um, but let me tell you, reasonable accommodations are changes in the workplace that will allow the person to do the essential functions of the job. For example, a person might have trouble um, uh, learning um, auditorily. So they might ask, you know, in the future, after you tell us an assignment, could you write it down as well? And that probably is pretty reasonable. Um, that's an example of an accommodation because they may not do that for other people. But for this person, because they have a learning disability, let's say, they will write out the, the assignment for him or her. So the first question in any of these discussions is, is an employee's disability affecting his or her performance of the essential job functions? So it's not what symptoms does the person have? You may have a person come to you and say, I'm so depressed. I can't do this job anymore. I need three weeks off. What do you do? I know what I would do because I don't want someone taking three weeks off, three months off or three weeks off. That's going to hurt the program. I want the person to continue to work as much as they can. So I'm not going to, a lot of times providers say, yes, you can have three months off or, uh, you know, we only allow two months, but maybe you can take the third month um, for something else. So you can have two months and we'll look at it then. My question is always, well, let's ask first, how, how was, how, how is it going on the job? And what are you not able to do because you're feeling this way? And it may be, you know, I can't use my story strategically. Um, I'm really struggling with that because of my depression. And I would say, all right, well, let's figure out if we can help you do that, even though you're, you're struggling with depression. Because um, I'm not gonna ask the person, you know, what are your symptoms? I, I, I feel like that is not so relevant because it's the question is is the person able to do the job so when you come to the threshold standards for what is reasonable um there are really two main pieces here and in, in the toolkit i have a whole chapter on this one is is the suggested accommodation reasonable meaning will it address the issue so if i have someone struggling with using their lived experience because of depression one accommodation I might, I might want to give is added supervision or added coaching on using your lived experience. And the person might say, that will help. I guess I can stay on the job, which is a great outcome. Or they might say, you know, that's not going to help because I'm just so depressed. And if that's the case, um, I, I, I may, you know, have to allow the person to, to take a little time off while I figure out you know, maybe they're so depressed they can't do the job, but and maybe I do need to give them time. But again, there may be things that the per the person may not be as depressed as you think, and they and they might be that might be their way of asking for help. And, and if you tell them, look, we'll have a coach for you, we'll have this for you, that's a great outcome because they're still working, and it's good for the company, it's good for the person. So don't stop your query about their symptoms. Ask what aspects of the job are they struggling at? Now, an undue hardship means that the accommodation places um, the company in a situation where they're not, not able to do the job sufficiently. So a person might ask for a year off. 
Um, and that's probably an undue hardship for the organization because they're going to be without a peer specialist in a position perhaps for a year or, you know, they're going to have to, they can look for a substitute, but it may be that, that a year is too long and, you know, you have to analyze in that, that in the, um, in every instance differently. Now, to be effective at doing this, there is something called an interactive process. This is legally required, actually. So if a person asks for an accommodation, you as an employer are required to engage in a process of back and forth, give and take. Um, kind of what I've described, you know, how can we help you do the job better? Person says, um, this can help, that can help. You say, well, we think this could be better or that could be better, but you want to engage in an in a interactive process. And again, my first question is not about illness or symptoms, but why, what aspects of the job are they having trouble with and how can we help them do it? Um, because it may be the depression, the anxiety is not, is rooted not simply in illness, but in other challenges of the job that they're frustrated with. So I have a chapter about this in the toolkit. Um, next slide, please. All right, we're heading to the end here. Preparing and engaging non-peer staff. I feel like I skipped something here. Um, Right, so, so this is an underestimated um, approach. And I just think it's unfair to non-peer staff to just bring a job person in there, bring a peer in there and, and you know, expect them to just be on board. So let me tell you, um, back up and tell you what some of the barriers are for the, um, well, let me tell you how, how um, first of all, how colleagues, let me, I'm sorry, I'm bouncing around here. So, so we, one of our, our, our young adult presenters told me what his primary barriers to making it as a peer specialist. And let me read those because they're, they're, they're very relevant. One of them is being consistently called during his time off. So, you know, that makes sense. Having a lived experience portion of the job disregarded and not discussing or checking in on coping skills. So lack of attention to the employee as an individual and helping them do their job. Experiencing stigma from coworkers. Well, that's really about mental illness and stigma is as active in providers groups as it in any other population. Providers tend to see people at their sickest. So they sometimes look at peers and feel like, they're they're at risk or um, not well enough, which is unfair. Feeling devalued because of not having a higher education or college degree. Um, getting in arguments with coworkers because of a disbelief that the person is intelligent and knows what's best. You know, devaluation. We know, you know, that's really too bad. Or not feeling supported in general. And that's what we're going to talk about in a second. Um, now, how colleagues are most helpful, I just wanted to report from our peer specialist what that is too. Um, being encouraged to take time off. Now, this sort of goes a little bit against what I, I said. I think, in my opinion, it's being encouraged to perform the job better and take time off. You know, it's, it's sometimes vacation time, sick time. Um, so I would agree with that. Discussing healthy coping skills during supervision having trusted colleagues be aware of early warning signs. So, so this peer is saying the illness is very relevant and they want the supervisor to know about that and how they can be helped. Honest, constructive criticism, feeling part of the team, having the person's limitations and preferences respected. Um, so again, that requires the supervisor to really understand the job. All right, so we're gonna finish up quickly here. Non-peer staff, education and training, team building, and I'll call measurement. Next slide, please. Um, so this is consistent, but the peer role, again, this, there's a code of ethics usually that the other staff should know about. Person first language, meaning person with schizophrenia versus schizophrenic, that's really critical to understand. Person-centered planning, self-determination and dignity of risk, shared decision-making. Um, these we hope people would already understand, but they need to be um, um, put in there. 
about how the active role for people with lived experience in decision making. I mean, one thing that's not talked about anymore is really informed consent on and that the person has the right. And it's really up to the provider to work with the client through, let's say, motivational interviewing to get to the place they need to go. Myths, myth, I'm sorry, myths of mental illness. Next, next um, slide here. Next. So this is something I put together. And I have a lot of things like this, but you know, the things people think when you talk to them. So I'll just do the first one here. Myth, insufficient work, experience, or education to work as a peer special. So that's what they think. And that could be true. So how do you mitigate that? Through so uh, resilience and persistence, workplace supports, healthcare support. And it may be that if the person's not working out, it may be a bad match. It may not be insufficient work experience. So in other words, we can acknowledge that the young adult may not have the work experience, but at the same time, we as an employer are saying, well, that's okay, we, we can address that. Another one is they can't work full time because they're using their social security, which is not true. Um, people can work full time and, and still be on these benefits. Maybe it'll be time limited or that they won't, through SSI, they won't necessarily receive money or they can always fall back on it, but this is a, a mistake that human resources and other people make. You know, being full-time has, has its advantages. I mean, because you, 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 being part of the team is a lot easier. There's more pressure when you're part-time in a certain sense. You know what I mean? It's like you have to get a lot done in a short period. So again, a training like this is important. Next slide. Team building activities, um, co-learning, cross-training. So that's just basically getting a group of people together and talking about for example, their role, why they're interested in the job, and maybe telling a personal story about that for a, a, in, a, in a small group. Having some time to build trust, um, employee mentorship, and in opportunities from, from informal interaction. So it's really hard right now for that, the latter one. I mean, you know, the coffee or the water cooler is, I used to go just to talk to people because because I felt isol isolated as the only rehab person. So, boy, I think this is a real loss for, for peers because it's how you get to know people, but maybe Zoom will create that in the future. All right, next slide. Okay, next slide. Um, I'll just, I'll just go on measurement. So when I mean measurement, I mean, there's a, there's a, I have a, um, a link there to the, to a, a manual provider out of California for, for implementing peer specialists. And I provide the page numbers, but they have like surveys and attitude um, surveys that would help an employer determine where their staff stand on um, certain issues. So the first one there is staff concern self-assessment. Um, so you could, that's one way of using these surveys to decide what trainings are most important at, at that time. Um, then they have some discussion questions on, on when you're um, talking to staff and peers together. Let's go to the final slide. Almost um, so wellness strategies. This can be again universal design. This is for everybody in the organization. You know, uh, people organizations succeed by satisfying their employees quite a bit. Um, it comes down to being. I think we find out is a good hiring is the first step, and then building up your staff is the second. Um, just an example of preventative. It's having coaching and mentoring available to young adults um, from other staff people or outside of the staff um, at UMass, we, we paid someone to provide some of that coaching, particularly around career development that made people feel really good. Um, so those are preventive and responsive, um, for example, is being clear on how to request and analyze accommodations like we discussed. So staff should be aware that accommodations are available and um, this is how they can request them. This is of course legally required, but that's not really the point because most providers don't really do much about that. I would highlight it that this is how we can 
help you with problems. And then the short term disability insurance is often available for people who need time off. Um, so let's, the, the final thing I want to say is from, again, our peer specialist is, who wants to say why it's important in the future to have this role. And the first thing he says is peer support is unique and relatively new, which we've talked about. So there's still a lot of development that needs to happen. Um, the sense of independence it gives to individuals is refreshing and empowering. We work with them where they are at and do not overwhelm them with cl clinical terminology. So, you know, they, they bring a naturalness to a discussion that is less judgment, feels less judgmental to the um, client. And that's a big deal. They're not diagnosing, they're not, they're just listening and providing feedback and coming up with ideas that are strengths based so that having that person in the team for the client is important. And finally, um, you know, I, people who take this job hope to grow through the job. And there are many benefits to that. And one of them is they, they get to see people over time getting better. And that's good for every staff to see people like that, to remind us that not everybody's going to be do well in a program. It's just outside the scope and possibility to do that. But to kind of keep in mind that we have people who have improved, done better, re gone into recovery, got jobs, and um, that's a role for the peer specialist can be a reminder of. So, okay, well, the final page is just some, some citations. And I have a few there, but these are all very good articles. But ultimately, I think the toolkit will provide you with um, what you need to do to move forward. The real question is, where should I start in the toolkit? Where am I in this process? Um, where is my staff in this process and what do they need to know? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Doman. That was a great amount of information to consider, especially when employing young um, peer providers and how to make a culture and environment that's best for them. So thank you so much for your expertise in sharing that. Now we would like to open up uh, for Q&A to the audience and we've allotted some time. So don't be afraid to write in the chat box any questions you have. Um, I know that um, Dr. Doman's even may be open to some ideas about some one-to-one -one scenarios and giving insight on that as well. Um, so please, you know, let us know your questions in the chat box and we will filter through those and ask and maybe even some people will give the opportunity to ask Dr. Delman directly. So please do that now in the chat box. Let's see. Just get a moment as everyone is typing. Um, so while we're waiting, Dr. Doman, I know that I heard you mention um, around the, the, the time off, kind of really finding a, a good balance with that. Um, you know, as a young peer provider myself in that experience, um, a lot of our generation says a lot around self-care. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to hear your thoughts about self-care from, you know, a millennial perspective, but also incorporating it in one's recovery. Um, but like you said, staying true to the integrity of the position. Yeah, that's a big question. Um, um, I think we, many of us have different needs for self-care. For example, my need is to keep working. If I'm out of, if I'm not working, I, I lose my structure. And, you know, so I, if I were a peer in, I, I, I would want someone to talk to me about how I can continue the job without taking time off, which may include some sort of counseling that, that I would take on. And maybe, you know, here's a good idea. Why don't you see a therapist if I haven't been, seen a therapist? Um, so that's, I, that's not preventive, that's responsive. And I think me personally, I don't do probably do enough self-care. So, but I see people doing this and I think meeting in groups, peer groups, like there are peer groups of young adult peers 
who, who, who work and talking to people who are in the same job as you, maybe there's one that meets every week or every month, peer support for everybody can be an enormous, amazing um, support for people. You can, you find, you may find out that you all share the same issue and that's comforting that you're, you are struggling with something that everyone else is, is struggling with. So to the degree that peer groups can be sponsored for, for these young people would be um, fantastic. I would say on the job, the organization um, should provide, make sure that, um, I think should provide um, wellness recovery action um, supports be developed by uh, employees if they want. No one should be forced to that, but if they want to, let's say an some, some peers want staff to know about their challenges and you don't have to disclose it, but they might say they should be given an opportunity to present something to the, to the staff, to the supervisors about what they need if they're in crisis. So it may be, if, I, if I'm in crisis, if I'm falling apart, please call so-and-so. Um, please um, offer me an opportunity to go to the beanbag room. We actually had, so, so that's an example of a wellness approach. But other than that, I do think, you know, the employer can, I don't know how often employers provide wellness opportunities. You often have to find those outside of the employer. And I think there's, there's a lot more available now. So I think it's important. I, I, I will give someone time off, but I, I, my goal with someone is if they're asking is to make sure that's, that, that there's no other, there aren't other opportunities for them to continue their job with supports. Does that, that answer the question? Yes, for sure. And thank you so much. I, I really think that that makes a good point to like not make it one size fit all uh, kind of approach and really knowing yourself and what you're requesting for self care and working with, um, you know, your supervisor to get clear on that. Right. And you can build a relationship with your supervisor. Um, yeah, and, and that's probably you get to know people just by, and you can let them know that you, you, you might have struggles and this is the kind of help I might need. Okay, wonderful. Um, so I saw we had some questions pouring in. I'm gonna filter through those and I'm gonna pass the mic for a second to Elise to really set the tone for the rest of our Q&A portion. Elise, you have the floor. Thank you and thank you to our panelists, Dr. Dahlman, um, staying to answer questions. A quick reminder for everyone, we have two options for you to ask questions of our panelists. You can either type your questions in the chat box, which we see a bunch of you have already been doing, or you can raise, use the raise your hand feature that's found when you open up your participant panel, and then we will call on you to unmute yourself. So if you just need to clarify your question or you want to speak directly to Dr. Delman, we'll do that. And I think for now, Juanita is going to start with reading through the questions in the chat box. So thank you. Thank you so much, Elise. And we'll go ahead and get started with that. Um, so our first question um, comes from Ms. Boyle. What is a critical in being a good supervisor to peers? Okay, well, we I did have a slide on this, and um, but I do think understanding the job, understanding why there's mutuality, what necessary, why, um, why the, there is sheer, sharing lived experience and what is the rationale for doing that. Really understanding the unique features and why they exist. That will allow the supervisor to coach someone on how to handle things better. If you don't understand the job, but this person's gonna just gonna shrug their shoulders, the supervisor's gonna shrug their shoulders all the time. And then secondarily to that, be really serious about understanding that this is an important job. I, and I as a supervisor wanna keep this peer specialist job because it's helping our clients and fighting for the person so that again, if, if other staff are trashing the job, you as a supervisor would be obligated to say, look it, you need to really understand more about this job and maybe we should set a time for you to meet with our peer specialist and we can talk about that. But, peer, but supervisor is advocate and um, understanding, 
under weekly, I would say you have to commit yourself as a supervisor to meeting weekly. And um, I, to me, those, those are the most, I mean, there are, there are tasks, there are prerequisites, I think. I'm talking about prerequisites, prerequisites to, to being a good supervisor. Knowing the, knowing the job that the person you're supervising um, and caring about that job and being an advocate. And then there are just good supervisory roles and tactics around teaching, um, collaborating. But I would say those are like, the, those are the prerequisites, those three. Meeting weekly, um, understanding, an advocate, understanding the job and advocating for the job. And then, the, if you, and then presumably, and then it'll flow from there. Wonderful, thank you so much. The next question comes from Ms. McCain. What ways do you suggest to reduce retention in this role, um, or maybe reduce tension in this role in relation to company culture? Um, Ms. McCain, if that is not the correct way you wanted this word, please let us know in the chat to clarify. One thing I really think about and I'm really developing some trainings for is how team leaders and other key people in the program can address this tension even in the moment. So if you're in a team meeting, um, you know, the, the, the peer is saying, this person says they want to work, we should help them work. And the clinician is saying, you know, this person's too sick to work, what are we going to do? If you let that go on for too long, it's probably not going to get anywhere and, and it could end up in a serious um, disagreement that hurts the team. The team leader should be able to kind of step in there and, and moderate, I would say. I'm not say mediate, but it's really moderate and say, you know, you both have some interesting points. Let's look at this from a recovery-oriented approach. Um, we need to start by identifying what the client wants. They want to work. Um, what are the risks or issues? And, and do those risks indicate the person shouldn't work? Now, granted, the perfect person has a right to work, and, 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 but you're sort of talking through the differences and it may be, but my final comment would be, you know, what, what, is, what is the worst thing that will happen if this person works? I mean, they'll lose a job. And the best thing about that is we're there to catch the person. So by, by being there to mediate, you're really helping the peer specialist, but you're also helping the other staff to get by the standard things they were trained are experienced and explain why working is, first of all, it, it's, it's um, it's it's mentally beneficial to the person. Second, what is the worst thing? I, you know, question, what is the worst thing that will happen if this person works, or even with not going on meds because or take, taking off meds? Because I've seen people leave meds, and some did well and some didn't. And when they didn't, they would just come back to treatment, and we were there to catch the person. So they're doing these things while they're in, in treatment, and, and so I would try to moderate and mediate those discussions to fill in why it helps organizationally into the person. And people should be really, you know, team leaders and the like should be in a skill to do that, not just stand there with like their, they're just there with their mouth open, they're not sure what to say. Help. Awesome, thank you. And, and she did clarify um, in the means of retention, keeping people at the agency and reducing turnover. So um, I'm sure that those aspects really speak to that as well, but do you have any other further insights around retention and keeping people? Yeah, I, I go back to the reasonable accommodation approach because that arises when a person is having trouble doing their job. So if you don't do anything, it's not going to get better. And if the per, you, it's, pro, it's probably not going to get better. Let's say the person's going through a depression and they're not doing their job. Um, that may get better, but it may be that, that, that you need to ask the person, are you having trouble with doing the job? You don't ask, are you depressed? You're just noticing the person's not doing the job well. And... If that's the case, so you're bringing it up, but not as a mental health problem, but as you're not, what's pro problem with the job? And the person may say, well, I'm very depressed and um, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. And through that, you may be able to come to an accommodation. So being proactive there, if you had not done that, the person may have been depressed, stopped working and disappeared. Um, so being proactive in, in addressing job challenges 
through a, a, a reasonable accommodation approach. Like, what, all right, so what can we do for you to help you with this job? Um, I've also seen outreach, let's say some people just stop showing off for work. And sometimes it's worth doing an outreach and saying, you know, we're with you. Cause it can be, you can feel very ashamed going back to work. I mean, so I've, I've had people work for me who didn't stop showing up and I, never, I couldn't even get in contact with them. And that was too bad. And we tried to reach them, but we couldn't. We had to let them go. But in some cases, it's, um, it will work if you, if you keep sending someone emails and saying, you know, we really do care about you. Um, we'd like you to continue. So I would say a, a proactivity in terms of addressing people's job difficulties in, in not waiting for, um, for things to get worse. And again, as I said earlier, to me, time off is only one possibility for dealing with a person's issues. The other thing might be extra supervision, job coaching, um, you know, referring them to, to a therapist. But to me, stopping work is, is maybe necessary, but it's not, it's probably the last thing I wanna see happen for somebody. Um, cause if they, if they stop working temporarily, it concerns me that they, I'm not sure what they're really getting by stopping work. Maybe we, we, we have them do part-time. Um, but stopping work completely to me is, is not the best outcome, even though that's fine. So uh, yeah, try to, try to figure out ways to keep the person working, um, through accommodations, but, but, not, but then having them not work is okay too. That's, I think that's the best way to, to manage retention. And I think those are really great points, Dr. Delman, because um, even if the person does have to take time off, like you're saying, honor that if that's necessary, but solutions still have to be put in place for preventative matters in the future and to see where, you know, uh, where the support is needed. And along those what now lines, Quinita, um, you know, even if a person's out, you, it may seem intrusive, but I, I would want to know, hey, you've been out for a while. Can you tell me when you're going to be returning? Um, and is there any help you need? Because a person could take time off and disappear into a room and get worse. I mean, in an ideal world, they're seeing their therapist, they're working on it, and I can't dwell into that too much as a supervisor, there are boundaries. But I may reach out to the person and, and, and you know, it's fair to ask them when they're gonna return, and it's fair to ask, is there anything we can do to help you return? But hopefully they're in therapy or something, or ch medication change, but if you're not, it's worth reaching out to people and just showing you care and they may seek out more advice from, from you as an employer. Thank you. Our next question is from Ms. Harris. How do you deal with coworkers' offense statements, offensive statements? Yeah. Um, I know how I want, I know how I <laughs> want to deal with it, but I think there are two things. So, they offend a peer worker. I think you got to pull them aside separately first. And, and you know, it may be that the, the, um, the employee doesn't use person for its language and they say, you know, that person's a schizophrenic. Um, I would pull them aside and explain to them that that's not the right way to do it. Um, we expect it this way. And then I would tell the, the peer that we're, we're dealing with it. I can't say too much, we're, we're dealing with it. And, um, and if it happens again, you know, just, just, just tell me. It's, it's, you know, it could be that we have to let a person go because they keep using offensive comments. Um, and when I say offensive, I mean unproductive. I mean, anything offensive, you know, a person's a weirdo, a freak, that doesn't tell me anything about a person. I mean, I wanna hear specifics about a person. So sometimes it could be offensive, but useful, offensive comments are, are usually diversions from what's really happening to the person. So that would be my reason for telling the person they're on probation or something that they're just not, it's offensive, but they're not helping the treatment team address an issue. I mean, sometimes the unions are involved and, and so it may vary, but I, I would, um, you have to give pers a person a second chance. And um, yeah, but I would talk to each party. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we have a question from Michelle Rolf. 
um, or will comment in as well. Very helpful presentation. Thank you. Um, yes, these slides are available or will be available after um, the conclusion tomorrow of our presentation on wraparound.org. Um, and you will be able to view the presentation as well because it is being recorded. So I look forward to you sharing that with your staff. Um, next question is from Ashley Miller. Are there any techniques that you recommend to help the highly empathetic not take on all of the struggles of their clients and take that home? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I, 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 I relate to this, um, as a person who was a vocational specialist and I see stuff and I wish things are going better for the person. And I don't think the clinical team is doing what they should be doing. Um, I think this is where it's a combination of things. I think good supervision is key and someone you can just share your concerns with um about care and at the same time and this is hard i'm not very good at it but realizing that you only have so much influence um and i and i've i, I have not done well in these situations i've been a little outspoken at times um it's hard to find a happy medium and to, to, to share your concerns. And it may be that you just, if you see a supervisor enough, you can talk to that person. Um, of course, peer support, you'll find out that every peer specialist is having this issue, I think. I think we're all empathetic enough and we see people struggle and it feels like we can relate to it directly. I think every clinician probably has to deal with this in a way, um, but with peers, we're, we're more um, sensitive to it. So I would again say join a, a peer support group and stay in good touch with the supervisor. There's, you know, you may get support from your family too. I mean, it's, you know, it's good for a peer specialist to have a family that's supportive of, of the person. You can talk to them. This is hard about this job. And I think other people will relate about what makes their jobs difficult too. So it becomes normalized. So share it with your um, uh, your um, support group, friends, and, and your supervisor. Thank you so much. The next question is going to be from Nafisa Alim. Um, the, let's see. I agree that peer supporters need supervisors that are open and invested into their position in the company, growth, and development. If clinical supervisors don't identify um, as mental health or substance use disorder, can they participate in a state-sponsored peer training? How should clinical or supervisors that want to learn more about supervising peer supporters that don't qualify as a peer become more familiar with the peer training? And that might be a helpful question um, if we have Zandaya still on the line. And we can also send you more information specifically about that. But, but John, if you, you want to respond, please feel free. This varies by state. I think yeah. Arizona, for example, requires, they have a special training for supervisors. I think Massachusetts is doing that now too. Um, it usually happens after the after peers are, are hired. Second, there are booklets out there, or manuals on... Um, there, there, there's, there's, so you can still get the materials for um, those trainings. And there are, um, I mean, if you look at the first three chapters of our book, it talks about it a, a little bit, but there are book uh, training booklets out there that cover, cover this. I know it's not the same as a training, but um, it's something you may want to expect people to read. Q. No. Yes. This is, this is Wilma. Hi, Wilma. Thank Zendaya, you. Zendaya and Sharon had to jump off at 11. Okay. But Ohio do have a supervisory training through um, the Recovery Supports Bureau um, for supervisors who supervises peers. 
So um, if you want more information on that, you should get a hold of Zendaya Lawson or Sharon Fitzpatrick. Yeah, that's no, that's that's speaking more about the supervisory training. Um, what Nafisa and is is talking about is more um, about if you don't identify as a peer. A lot of times, clinicians don't identify as SUD or mental health. Um, they're they're not vulnerable, or they just don't. And so, if someone wanted to take the training so that they could be better supervisors or they could be better clinical directors. How would the state of Ohio sponsor that? And so I think you're right. I think that this is a question maybe we should we should have with, with those ladies because that yeah, that's something that Nafisa, to, Nafisa speak on it. Yeah, you do not have to be a peer yourself to be a supervisor of peer support. Did you realize that? Um I, I did, but still, it's not, it's not about just the supervisor training, you know, is, is good, but it's still not the peer support training, you know. And so, in other words, if clinicians um, were able to take the peer support training, they would probably get a better idea. We talked a lot about how to, you know, how to make peer support specialists a part of the team. And it's hard to be a part of the team if you don't like you said, understand the special role that peer supporters play. And so if people who don't identify as SUD or mental health, if they were able to take the training, it would give them specific insight and then um, better be able to supervise and direct them. I think it's more the point that, that we're One making. thing I will that. say, and, and, and I would definitely love to hear from uh, Nafisa if um, she would like to respond as well. Um, <laughs> To clarify, I, I, my understanding for not having supervisors being in the training is to have a specific space for peers um, and learning that and honoring, you know, the peer title. But I do see and understand um, the need to bring together the understanding of the peer training and how the supervisor um, can best utilize the peer in, in their role. Um, so that definitely sounds like something that we can continue and follow up with. Um, Nafisa, go ahead. Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, my question was, um, uh, yeah, I've noticed that the buy-in um, to um, for clinicians that aren't familiar with the peer, even with the trainings, and the things that are going on. The buy-in hasn't been um, with clinicians because they're not familiar with the peer um, trainings because they do see it as an outside thing and they don't understand what it takes to become a peer, the stories and the identifying you know, principles of peer support. Them being exposed to peer training in some way will possibly get clinicians to buy in and understand how the peer supporters play a role and how that, you know, they, they bridge the gap. So I think it's no particular program or training to bridge clinicians mm -hmm. as supervisors to peer support as far as training exposure, not reading, you know, but exposure to their training and what they actually go through to come, become peer supporters. Me personally, as a clinician, going through the peer support training, I understand the whole process and I get it. And it's so important for clinicians in order to supervise and understand all roles, the supervisory role, the clinic, you know, all roles to be able to be exposed to that peer support training at some point. Mm -hmm. I think that would uh, just really give to the buy-in of supervis you know, supervisor. You, you're bringing up a really, really good point that there needs to be training of provider agencies and mm -hmm. staff about what is peer support what's the value of it, how you work as a team, not so much that your people have to go through the peer support training, but what is it that you need to know and understanding what the training that the peers go through that you're exposed to it. I think that's real, real important um, type of training that needs to take place. I, I would agree with that because you want the non-peer staff to be part of it, to be positive, to see that they're part of the, the positive change. Um, they're necessary, and 
you know, if they can go with the program, they'll do great. And the great thing about this is I think part two, day two of our conference will really speak to that and giving you insight because we will have a panelist of young peer providers as well as their supervisors, um, well, some of their supervisors uh, um, participate and talk about some of those barriers, talk about kind of really engaging that culture and getting that buy-in that you were talking about. So please stick around and stay tuned for day two. And we will definitely also, you know, bring these insights to the proper channels as well. And to wrap up our Q&A, we have um, questions from Beth Boyle. I'm gonna kind of mix those together. Uh, the first part is, what if you post for a peer position, you don't get any applicants? What is the best mechanism for recruiting peers? Um, wow. What has worked out the best? Um, I'm not sure. There's, there's information on that. I, I, I would tend to do all at once. I, I tend to, I mean, you can only rely, rely on word of mouth somewhat, but yet it can be very effective if all your staff is, are recruiters. Um, I find that college boards, listservs, there's a lot of people who are in college are people who are struggling in college. They might, and who, who have a mental illness or believe they have a mental illness. And, and yet these people have made a step forward in their life to at least start college. And you're kind of looking for, when I hire someone, what, what, what's, if they've done anything to kind of establish themselves, or if they've done anything to prove they can accomplish something, I have to be, so it could be they've finished high school, it could be that they finished a year of college and now are working. Um, but I, you know, in Boston, well, it may be because in Boston we have a, a zillion colleges, so that kind of seems to work here. I'm not sure where you are, but colleges, um, short of that, I, I, I would be um, going to conferences where for young adult peers or just peer specialists, um, putting yourself right there and also peer specialists, knowing who's in the peer specialist classes and recruiting from day one. It's just part of, it's a part of networking to going at, at these things and I think that's important. You'll get someone that way too. If people are, the question is if people are, are if their peer specialists exist and they're graduating and they're in a geographic area, it, it is kind of up to you to entice them um, to join in. But I don't think, information. And I don't think a lot of people realize that the Office of Recovery Supports have a listing of all of the peers really? that, that um, are certified mm -hmm. and you can look at them by your regions to see who's out there, you know, and start recruitment that way. Interesting. Another great thing that happens in Ohio um, is during, well, this was in person, but I'm sure that you can still do it virtually during the in-person trainings, um, letting people know like at the end that there are some employers that are looking to hire peers. So if you do end up becoming, you know, certified and things of that nature, please, you know, give us a call. So that's a great way to. Um, and the last question is kind of once again geared towards um, the state around, um, and this is from Beth, um, is there some kind of peer support support group um, once um, peers are hired, like a learning community to learn from each other and learn new t um, tools and skills? Um, I know that in the past, there was a learning community um, via phone. I think it was like a monthly check-in. Um, and we can definitely follow up on that to see if that's still happening at the state level, Beth. Um, but John, if there is anything that you know about like a nationwide kind of um, network or thing of, of that nature, please let us know. I mean, there are listservs which you know, are not as effective as, as actually talking to someone. Um, but I'll check that out. Hopefully, you know, you can always start a group too. 
but, I, but I'll, check, I'll check that out. Awesome. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Delman. We really appreciate it in the Q&A. We are now going into our lunch break portion where you have about 30 minutes to really decompress, um, get you some coffee, something delicious, and we'll see you back at 11.50 a.m. Thank you, everyone. Welcoming everyone back in. Oh, sorry, let me start my video. As we're welcoming everyone back in from the break, um, we're gonna get ready to start our presentation on how to life. And I'll make sure to give you all a formal introduction. Um, Elise, do we have the slide with their pictures on there before? The screen sharing now, so we might have to. Oh, okay, wonderful, got it. Okay, so I'll just go ahead and, um, start with that. So welcome back everybody from your break. Hopefully everything was great and you had a chance to stretch and get something delicious or maybe a cup of coffee to keep you energized as we go through the second part of our agenda today. And up next we have Steve Osborne and Chelsea Greathouse um, to speak with us about How to Life. It's a youth targeted mobile app and they're going to demonstrate with us and also have some time for Q&A. So I will pass that over to Steve and Chelsea. Thank you so very much. Everyone, I'm Steve and Chelsea's waving at you in the other <laughs> window. And uh, we are from an organization called How to Life. And uh, our, our organization is really trying to help young people cross that chasm from, uh, you know, early teens into early adulthood. And we've, uh, we do that through education and encouragement and providing them resources. Uh, we do all of that through a mobile app. And that mobile app is typically sponsored or rolled out by a school or by a, a health or social-based organization. Uh, it, it tends to be geographically uh, rolled out as well. So we rolled it out last year in uh, Southwest Ohio in several schools and uh, had some real good success with it. We also got a lot of great feedback. We're just about to release version two of it with a ton of improvements. Uh, all of those improvements you'll see today. Um, we do, uh, you know, we do this uh, pretty much really just to, to, to help the individuals and, and, um, both the organizations and the youth. And Ms. Chelsea, who is here with me today, she not only helps run the app on a day-to-day -day basis, but she uh, her big contribution is to content. She helps take the and create the content that we have and get it into the app, get it uh, for uh, for people to consume. So with that. Now I'm just moving a couple things around on my screen here so I can actually see my own slides. So How to Life is a mobile app and it's designed for delivery from ages 23, or I'm sorry, from 13 to 24. And again, like we said, it's trying to help them grow up into strong and independent and healthy adults. It leverages national, state, and local resources uh, as well as education, and aggregates them into just a one easy to use single place to go where they can find all kinds of neat resources and help. We've also, we learned or realized a long time ago, while this may sound like a really great idea to adults, you know, uh, the 13 to 24 year old crowd is the toughest audience in the entire world to do anything with. And uh, to that point, we realize that even if you're giving them good education and even if you're giving them resources and encouragement, you may have to incentivize them as well. So we put together a reward system for them. So as they go through and they new, learn new life skills uh, or learn about new resources that are available to them, and they're rewarded by earning points, and those points can be spent on real world items. So just a really brief history of us. Um, this uh, app really came out of a, a group of us that were here in Southwest Ohio. 
Um, each one of us had experienced some trauma, some form of trauma in our lives or with our children. Um, uh, one of the members of the group that were here actually um, experienced the loss of, of their son to, to teen suicide and some other uh, had had opioid issues. So we, we just kind of got together and said, okay, so what can we do? And uh, after a lot of thinking and brainstorming, we came up with the idea of the app. And uh, as I said, we, had, we did test the app last year in six South, South, Southwest Ohio schools. And we've um, partnered with some state organizations that have been helping us as well. So let's talk about what it can do. So one of the very first things that it uh, does is it allows youth to get help online. Again, from those national, state, county, local school organizations. Uh, it recognizes who's the student, who the student is, what their geography is, and supplies them with the appropriate type of help. It also provides them peer and adult support connections. So uh, it's a por portion of the app called My Favorite Five. And these are my favorite five people. Of course, it doesn't have to be five. But it's people who I know that love me and care for me and uh, that are going to be with me as I, as I uh, make my way down this path. The app really started off with online learning. So uh, Chelsea, great house, is the person who um, brings all of that uh, content together, kind of coalesces it from all kinds of different sources, and then creates it in a form or a fashion that our targeted age group will actually consume. As they do that, they earn points. And as they earn those points, they can set, spend those points on real world, real live incentives. One of the big ads that we did to the most recent release is we've added a lot of what's called gamification. I'm sure you folks are all familiar with that term. Um, uh, just levels, uh, bonus points, gems, uh, special things inside the app that they can unlock as they climb in levels and, and, uh, and achieve different things. We also have the ability to communicate to our users through a, uh, a typical carousel right here. So the organization that is sponsoring this, be it a school or be it um, a mental health organization, they can literally speak to their users on a messaging carousel. And then if a school is using it or, or some organization like that, we can add anything, practically anything at all to the app. Um, jobs, uh, job search, um, a school bus tracker, you name it, we can make it happen. It's, the app, however, is really based on, on promoting emotional well-being. So we put all of our help resources right up top. The Get Help, the Favorite Five, um, which helps fight uh, isolation, and, uh, and also our, our other resources. So when a, when a user launches the app, they will occasionally be presented with this screen, just asking them how they feel. And depending on what they choose, um, it will either provide them, it will, it will ask them how, how severe is, is this thing that you're feeling? Do you want help immediately? Or would you like to learn more? And so, you know, just depending on what you click, I can click, you know, I'm happy, I'm good, I'm loved, I'm hungry. I'm not feeling well, or maybe I'm anxious. And depending on what topic you click, it'll ask you, what are you anxious about? You know, what do you, you know, uh, how are you feeling? And you can then go pick that. And then uh, the, the app will offer up either content, re oops, content resources, forgive me, I'm a little fast with my fingers there. Content resources, or they can see, they can skip this. Now, content is kind of like online education. Resources are exactly that: people and/or organizations that are there to help them, and they can do that either either in an immediate sense, or, if you will, um, um, maybe a not so immediate sense. It makes finding state and local resources really easy. One of our um, one of our primary resources is the, the uh, crisis text line uh, for hope. Uh, the 
app is designed to know your geography, to know who you are, and you can, you can see the different organizations that are available. And this list will go, um, you know, there can literally be hundreds in there. And it also allows the user, if they wish, to filter, man, my fingers, my mouse is really fast here. Let's try this again. It also allows them to filter. So, I, you know, if I want to, if I want to find something that has to do with substance abuse, or if I want to have something to do with I'm having problems with my home life, or if I want to do, you know, you know, maybe I'm experiencing bullying, whatever that is, I can filter those resources and I can either look at them at a national level, a regional level, or maybe just inside my school. We also like to connect them with peers and adult mentors, and we do that with a favorite five. Basically, favorite five creates a hot list of trusted contacts, people that the user feels very comfortable with. The other thing that it does is it keeps track of how frequently and or how much or how you've contacted these individuals and can give the user a little nudge or can give the, the favorite five contact a little nudge if they haven't been in contact over a certain period of time. You know, hey, it's been more than 30 days since you've talked to Greg and maybe Greg will get that same alert on his phone. Say, hey, Greg, it's been over 30 days since you've talked with Steve. Maybe you just wanna say hi, click here to say hi. You know, just to keep uh, in touch. Uh, we learned from the different organizations that we were working with, both uh, uh, NAMI and the uh, Cincinnati uh, uh, Children's Medical Center, that uh, one, of the, one of the contributors to teen suicide is isolation. And this is really designed to kind of keep that from happening as best we can. We also have a huge library of content which includes not only well-being items, bullying, substance abuse, emotional well-being, uh, but also things such as life skills and um, uh, other types of, of resources. Each user gets to take that content. They, they run between three or four minutes and 15 minutes. Try to keep them uh, smaller. The user also gets to, not only when they're done, watching it or going through it. They have to answer some questions at the end. And then they also get a chance to rate the content and send back any comments that they would like. They can also share any of this content on social media with their friends. Now here's an example of some of the content. And uh, this is specifically about employment, this content. And I may have to, give me just a second. I'm gonna switch over and, and open it up, so, up uh, outside of. Yeah, hold on just a second. I'm actually just uh, launching this from There we go. It's coming. So this is an example of the content that has to do with employment. This was created for Northeast Ohio. So it talks about not only, um, can, you, can you folks, can you see what's on my screen? There should be three icons, where to find a job, interview tips, how to keep a job. They can't see it, Steve. Cannot, well. Cannot. We still have employment. How about now? Now you got it. There we go. Where to find a job, interviewing tips, uh, how to keep a job. So where to find a job specifically. This was done for Cuyahoga County. 
talks about the different websites that are available for them. Talks about some very specific links where they can apply for jobs. I can go to those places, follow those links. Talk about how to use specific sites. So I can do all of that. Oops. My controls are again in the way. I can also see interviewing tips. How to respond, how, what to expect and how to respond to different questions such as salary questions, questions about the company and or your education, your career goals. What happens when people ask you behavior, behavioral questions? What's the best way um, to address those? as well as personal questions. Here's one that I did not know myself, being an employer. Beginning in 2020, employers can't ask you about your pay history. Also talks just about how to prepare for an interview. Know where you're going, show up early. That's just an example of some of the life skills content that we have. We've got quite a bit of it. how to keep your house and or your apartment clean, how to apply for college. Um, again, we've got, uh, well, we're probably tracking at close to 70 to 100 courses right now. Um, all of them in the different topics. So people ask a lot of times, where's that content come from? It comes from places like the Linder Center of Hope, the United Way, the CDC, uh, NIH, SAMHSA, Children's Hospital. Uh, we get uh, permission to, to use all this content. Unfortunately, a lot of the content is in hard copy, and it's written, as I always say, it's written by 50-year-olds to be you know, read by 50-year-olds. So we do change it around. Uh, we, we don't change the content per se, but we do put it in a format uh, in which kids are uh, kids youth are much more likely to consume it here's an example this is also a, one of our really popular features um, you know I'm in my 50s so when I was growing up these were called motivational posters but now they have a new name they're called memes and uh, the, the user can be presented with these on a periodic basis of their choosing. And it just, again, providing that encouragement to them, just getting them you know, into positive thoughts so they can not only mark their, you know, see a meme and mark it as their favorite, but they can also go in and search by category. You know, it's, you know I wanna see things that are on faith or courage or happiness or strength, and those things will be delivered to them. We also have incentives and rewards. So the users are frequently presented with point opportunities. They can earn points for watching any of that content. They can see how much that they can earn. The courses are designed to where you cannot just press go and walk away or just click through them. Um, it will sense that you'll, you'll fail and you don't get any points. So you do have to be proactive. You do have to be paying attention. And we make the quizzes to where you do have to actually have 
had to have read what's in there or you won't get through it. Now the points of course can be redeemed with local sponsors. And these are some real sponsors that we had down here. Kings Island, Chick-fil-A, Dave and Buster's. We found that people really want to help. These local businesses, businesses in your area really want to help. And if you go out to them and say, hey, this is what we're doing. Here's how we're trying to help the young people in our area. Um, we have no problems getting stuff from them. They redeem any one of those prizes or rewards in store. I can also tell you this, Chick-fil-A sandwich is by far and away the most popular reward ever created. Um, people dig Chick-fil-A. I guess if you didn't need me to tell you that, if you just went through their drive through anytime recently. So you can click on redeem. It'll bring up a barcode or a QR code. They scan it right there and you get your free stuff. Free stuff just for learning, just for using an app that helps you. And by the way, it's also great for the local sponsors because it does bring people in and helps them with their business. So we can also add other features to the app if you have one in mind or like um, uh, some that other people have come up with job search, uh, school links or student ID. The job search allows you to find any job in your area from any of those sponsors, uh, where they're located, what they're paying, and you can actually apply for that job right there from your hand. School links. So what's my cafeteria menu? What's my sports, my schedule, their Twitter feed, whatever, you, whatever the school would like to have configured can show up here. Things like a student ID or other types of ID, you can have it electronically. One of the things that our students asked for early on was can we get a student ID because I guess they're constantly losing theirs, but they never lose their phone because it's never out of their hand. So just in, in brief summary, uh, the How to Life is a mobile app, to, again, designed to help youth 13 to 24 cross that chasm of adolescence, get them growing into strong, healthy young adults. It's got great flexibility for schools, for uh, social organizations, for um, county health organizations. And it brings together resources, education, and incentives all together. Um, and it's, it's been pretty popular with the kids. So I'm actually going to skip through that. Here's some of our local community partners. These have been great people to work with. People ask, how well does it work? So this was a survey. We actually didn't even do this survey. We actually, the, the King School District came back and said, oh, I'm sorry, I'll show you the survey in just a bit. So we've got students, 83% uh, of the students at a school uh, will download the app and each month about 72% will use it. After 90 days, we have 62% retention. Now we'd like for that number to be higher, but um, what we found out was the average app retention after 90 days is 10%. So we're doing much better than the normal app. Our content gets really good ratings. The average session time is about the length of a piece of content and uh, rewards are on the rise. Now here's some real comments from real students. We've collected well north of a thousand of these. And well into 90% of them are positive. So Kings did a survey of the, just a, one class, just one class that was their health class. And uh, it was rolled out to, I think this is 31 students. And at the end, without letting us know, they took the survey and sent us over the information. Well, we put it in the presentation here. Do you think the information was useful? We got strongly agree and agree. This one was very interesting. I read other content than the content that was, that was not assigned by my teacher. In other words, 
uh, the teachers were assigning content that had to do with a health class, but the students themselves would actually go in and read additional content. Uh, what well, I learned new information, and this one shocked me. Now, think about this. This was um, this class was a bunch of freshmen in high school. I'm not sure the last time I felt like I taught a French freshman in high school anything, because by the time they're freshmen in high school, they pretty much know everything there is to know. So, this one I was really happy to see. They enjoyed using the app. Oh, by the way, so let's go back. We hunted this one kid down. We found him. We kicked him out of school. I'm just kidding. We didn't do that. So the article helped me think differently about different topics. And we think we should continue uh, to use the app in school. And the one kid that said no uh, thought it was a device to spy on him. So it's not, I promise. Guys, I'm going to pause. That's the vast majority of the of the information that I have, and I'm, I'd like to take some questions if they're out there. Thank you. So thank you to our presenters. I was laughing the whole time. I think that's something we lose in these virtual platforms because people are muted. It was very funny. Um, yeah, it, it, uh, yeah. I, you know, I was dropping some of my best uh, jokes, and I, I wasn't getting any responses. So I was feeling kind of unloved. I know it. I was laughing. Okay, thank you. So I will remind people that, again, if you have any questions for Steve or Chelsea, you can ch type it into the chat box, and Juanita will go ahead and read those. Um, or you can raise your hand by clicking on the participants um, thing and raise your hand and we will go ahead and unmute you so you can ask verbally also if that's what you um, prefer. So I will go ahead and open it up to Juanita um, and see if there are any questions. Hello, yes, it's time for our question and answer. Um, and we'll just filter through that. I'm seeing a lot of people say how great the app is and wonderful feedback. So it looks like our first question is from Karen Gregory. And she was wondering, is the app available now? Yes, it is. So we have uh, the, our previous version of the app was, that was available. Um, it's been out for over two years. The most recent version of our app will be released in October, so just in a few weeks. So if you have interest in it uh, for all intent and purpose, for you, it's available now. Uh, we probably, you know, we may, t may take t uh, until maybe November to get you rolled out, but we could start those conversations immediately. All right, Karen says thanks. Any other questions that people are wanting to know? I know people are um, very excited. Um, they're grateful for this information, saying how incredible it is. Um, if I could, uh, Cassandra, you've, um, you're in the Northeast and haven't heard of it. Um, it's actually with a, a private organization. We're rolled out with a private organization that uh, helps young people. Uh, especially foster children. So it hasn't necessarily hit the schools or hasn't hit um, the public health organizations. But um, if you like it, I'd be more than happy to um, introduce you or your team or whoever. That sort of feeds into my question, Steve or Chelsea. Um, you showed that there's um, rewards and stuff that are done locally. So if an agency wants to roll this out in their agency, would they get with you to try and solicit some local um, businesses to be included in the app? Or what would be the process for somebody to get this in their location or city or agency? Yeah, so absolutely. We will help you um, 
identify and help you uh, recruit uh, organizations that could uh, create rewards for you. And the way it typically works is uh, you know the area fairly well. So you, so you would say, hey, I think X, Y, and Z, you know, I'm, clearly we can find Chick-fil-A and Wendy's. That's not a problem. But there's other organizations. You know, I know that this organization is, is really socially responsible or they're really into this kind of stuff. They'd be, they'd be willing to help. We've got all the materials. So we just, we essentially ask you, uh, we put together a, a, a reference letter and we'll contact them on your behalf and we'll do some recruiting for you. So it's joint effort. We don't expect you to know the app or how it all works or all of the details behind that. We do that work for you. Okay, it looks like we have a question from John Stewart. He's wanting to know, when will the app be more um, you know, readily available, have a wider range or wider reach? Uh, next month. So uh, if you have interest in it, please contact us now and we'll be more than happy to get you rolled out. So we'll be more than happy to show you the app and what it's doing and um, start talking about what implementation looks like for your organization. Okay, Heather Wells has a question. What is the cost to a district? So it takes us about $20,000 to do it on for an average dis district. Now, that's what the cost is, but what the school tends to pay, what a school tends to pay is in about the 5K range. And the reason that is, is as we're speaking with our sponsors and, and other organizations, it's very easy for us to find sponsors for your school. So you can think in your mind, it, you know, it probably costs my school about 5K to do it. Now, we also have some schools that just don't, I mean, they're just because of where they are, or who they are, and, and their demographic. 5K is incredibly, that's a lot of money for them. Maybe they just can't find it. Um, we're able to help there as well. One of the reasons why there is some cost is we want the organization who's rolling it out to have at least a little bit of skin in the game. We found that when we put it out for free, um, people treated it like nothing. But if you put a little bit of a price tag to it, people actually will pay attention and make sure that it gets rolled out. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, our next question is, um, someone wanted to get further clarification about what area is the app currently available in? Throughout Ohio. Is so, that for currently or um, in the next month? Well, just go ahead and contact us now and we'll get an implementation schedule for you. There's only so many we can do every month, but we're going to be starting those next month and uh, Stark County is one. I see Holly chimed in here. Uh, we've been talking to uh, Stark County um, and uh, hopefully we'll be rolling something out for their, uh, their health department here soon. Awesome, thanks. Um, are districts who previously used Student Suite now using this app? Yeah, so we're going back to them right now. Uh, as you can imagine, when we came to them this late this summer and talked to them about rolling the this app out again, um, I don't know. They seem to be preoccupied with something this, I don't know, this COVID thing. Uh, and so uh, we weren't going to be ready to roll out until October anyway. But we would like to think that they will all um, uh, basically move to the new version of the app. If they're going to stay with the app, or they'll definitely be on, on the new version. And on the schools that we had here in Southwest Ohio, we had, I'll say, you know, mostly good results. We had a couple of schools that, that did really struggle with their rollout. Um, 
And, and a lot of that just has to do with the school's commitment to it. Okay, uh, Cassandra is wanting to get clarification. Is there any um, apps uh, of the app being used in Summit County? No, not currently. And you'll forgive me, I'm from Southwest Ohio, so Summit County is about where? Yes, I can. It's right next to Stark County, so I could see it, okay. yeah, being used. Yeah. We like, to, we like doing things together in close geographies, getting multiple organizations using it in the same geography, because as you can imagine, you know, the, the, the sponsors, the restaurants and the, you know, the King's Islands of the world, they don't, they don't see the world by our geographical boundaries. They're just up and down the street, you know, uh, from where I, we're in Mason, Ohio. We're right next to Deerfield Township. Well, no one thinks when they're driving down the street, oh, I just left Mason. They just know that, you know, that's, that's where I'm going to go to dinner tonight or that's where I'm going to go over to Kings Island. So we love to have a, a, a group, a cluster of organizations because then we can leverage each other's sponsors. I think we're going to get us a little geography lesson as well, Steve. So we're having questions now about Lucas County. I'm going to have to bring up my map of all. <laughs> I'm not great with counties, but uh, nothing in Lucas County. Here, so in the counties in which we, um, which we uh, are working are really down in Hamilton, Warren, Butler, Claremont uh, counties in the, in the southwest corner. We're working on the east side of Cleveland right now and um, other than that we're in discussions with other people so and and if you have interest in it I'd love to have a, just a discussion with you can I let me type in my email message or my email that'd be great and I believe Lucas County is more northwest. So um, right now, it sounds like that's more northeast with Cleveland. But we don't mind because mm -hmm. it's an electronic implementation. So, and I don't mind hopping in my car. We're doing this for the good, right? For the good of the people. And if you want my, here's my cell phone number. And if you don't mind with my cell phone number, if you'd be so kind. Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't sending that to everyone. Thank you. Quinita. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you for catching me there. Um, if you'd be so kind with the cell phone number, if you just text first, because I don't know about you guys, but I'm getting a lot of calls that want to talk about my car warranty and about... Uh, <laughs> You know, my package that was supposed to be delivered and then all this, you know, you know, you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Spam calls. Yes. So just text me first. If you text me first, and I'm, as Steve, I'm talking, you know, I'm, I'm going to call you about how to life. I'll recognize the number and I'll pick up. Lucas County is Toledo area. Thank so, you. Heather, yes, I can. I do have uh, updated marketing information that you can share with your district leaders. And for you, Miss Heather Wells, I will actually drive it over to you personally. Um, Heather has really been uh, very <laughs> supportive. Says great. Yeah, very supportive. Heather's been very supportive. And as a uh, matter of fact, some of the ideas, the new ideas that came with uh, with our this most recent release came directly from Heather. Oh, so yeah. it's a pleasure that you're on Heather. Um, yes. Rob Manning has a question about um, this. He said this helps youth up to age 24. And um, I have a youth in adult trade schools in college, community colleges use this. So Outside of high schools, have we seen youth in trade schools and community colleges use How to Life? You know, we constantly are getting asked that question, and there's really no difference for, to us, whether it's being used in a high school, middle school, trade school, or even a college. And there has been many suggestions that have, to us that have said, you know, I think this would work better um, just above high school. So we're more than happy to do it. 
So if you've got, you know, if you've got a trade school or a, you know, a um, community college and you'd like to do, you'd like to do this, absolutely. We'd love to do it with you. And so as Jill just wrote. Oh, wait, one second. Joyce Weedle wanted to know, she was a little further up. Where in Claremont County schools is this being used? And then we'll jump right to Jill. Uh, so let's see, our Claremont County School. I'm going to have to pull out my. Not Loveland. Well, Loveland is, is that way. Hold on a second. I'll get right back with you on that. Okay. Um, for Jill's question, the Ohio Healthy Transitions Project is ages 16 to 25 and is all set to utilize this as well for Cuyahoga, Cuyahoga, I can never say that county name, I'm sorry. Cuyahoga. Cuyahoga, sorry, in Lorain County for young people. Thank you, Heather. Yes, it was Milford. So it's not, it's not currently active at Milford. We ended it with the last school year. Um, one of the reasons Milford was ending it was they had made a decision not to allow their students to use their cell phones at school. Though it was incredibly popular at Milford. So uh, now with the new version, we're gonna circle back to Milford. And yes, it was Milford. Thanks again, Heather. I don't know if they've, I don't know if anybody works with Milford schools, if they've, have they gone back on that decision or not? If they have, let me know, just drop it in the chat. Okay. Any other questions? From folks. Well, um, while we're waiting, I, I want to hear from um, you, Steve, and also Chelsea, feel free to, um, you know, add to this as well. As we're here talking about peer support and young peer providers, um, you know, what are your thoughts about how to life being incorporated in peer support for the young adults and also youth? Well, I think probably the primary function that you could use with this app uh, to support them is uh, their favorite contacts list, um, their, fav uh, their favorite five. The ability for them to not only identify who those people are, but the process that we take that group through when we talk about what a trusted conversation looks like and how that works and your commitment to supporting each other. Um, so, and, and just the periodic nature in which it drives that, um, that contact, that interaction, I think is extremely positive. And it, it's not only peer, but it's also adult support. And you know, of course it could be more than five people. We just put a number on it that, you know, like to see everybody have at least five people they can talk to, five friends, if you will. Um, uh, that's one way. I, I also think that the education, so any organization can drop any education that they want in the app for their group. So if you've got a group and you've got some special content and you only want it to be seen by the people that are in the app that are your people, uh, we can do that. So we can put in, we can put people in and, uh, and put content in and match them up so that they're just your users. So think of it as, uh, an, as an education delivery platform that's also got some nice uh, you know, additional benefits. Let's go to Kings Island. Let's go to uh, Cedar Point. Let's want a bike. I would also add that the online resources tab gives you the quick access to resources that otherwise you might not have thought to reach out to. And throughout the content, so like I recently wrote a piece of content on intro to mental well-being and intro to mental illness and how to help someone with their mental health. 
And all those courses kind of give you the toolkit of what to do if you're struggling and how to reach out to people and who you can reach out to. Thank you both. Um, Heather chimed in and said, I think this would be a great tool for youth peers to use with the youth that they are connected to, to build skills and help them understand and use the new information. So very, very useful in this work. All right. Um, we could call on some folks as well if, if people are interested in asking their question rather than typing. Just raise your hand, use the raise hand feature, um, which is located on I think, participants. But if not, we'll pass over to you all for wrapping up. Well, again, just happy. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity to talk to you guys about what we're doing and um, looking forward to providing you guys some feedback with our, with our new content and with our new app. And if anyone has uh, interest in rolling this out to their organization, their county, their school, whatever, please just reach out to me and I will be more than happy to get you going. Thank you so much. I appreciate you all coming and talking about how to life. Um, and once again, we have your contact information in the chat. So folks, remember to send the text message so that you are filtered and not spam. All right, or else Steve's going to think you are calling about his car warranty. <laughs> um, Oh, last part before we go into talking about CEs, Elise said this would be great to share not only with specific agency leadership, but also atomist boards and schools, universities, etc. Especially during our current situation, when we are all somewhat a little eerily disconnected at times. We will include contact for Steve and Chelsea when the materials are sent out after the presentation. So thank you very much, Steve. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you so very much for having us. No problem. We'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. In regards to CE information, for the following disciplines, once again, social workers, mental health counselors, prevention professionals, chemical dependency counselors, psychologists, and of course, this can be used towards your peer support certificate. Please look forward to the Survey Monkey from Jolene Thomas. That will be tomorrow. And if you have any questions about CEs, contact Jolene Thomas at jolene.thomas at mha.ohio.gov. And I will make sure to put that in the chat box as well. Next slide, please. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate you all uh, making time to come and talk about this wonderful topic. And we're excited to energize people all across the state about employing young peer providers and really destigmatizing, um, you know, the conversation, the thoughts that we might have because of not being aware. Um, so thank you all. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow to wrap up the conference for employing young peer providers. Have a great rest of your day.